sometimes gives them also uh, it sometimes gives the universities also some idea about what you're looking for when um, you, you know when um, you ask for a specific question then they because they have so much information about the university and about the admissions process that it's always a very good idea for you to ask a specific question so that you know they would know what to share and what would really be meaningful for you so i'll encourage you to please use the opportunity to ask them questions right okay so uh, as you know this is what our agenda for the day is we've got um, beginning with a short session on how you understand uk colleges and how you make a uk college list which i'll quickly run you through then we have uh, sarah roberts from imperial college london which is one of the best places you can study stem in uk uh, she'll be talking about debunking myths about applying to top uk college Colleges. I'm actually really interested in the myths that she wants to debunk. Um, will she be telling us that uh, you don't really need top class grades and they'll be looking at someone who's got an interesting profile uh, as well? Let's see what she has to say. So then we have uh, Veer Anand from University of St. Andrews. That's a very interesting session where he's talking about the flexible Scottish degree, which is slightly different from the degree that you will get in England, right? So the Scotland degree to begin with is four years. And then he'll also be giving you a look at careers in the UK. So after you study in the UK, what might careers in the UK be like? Then uh, there is a Palak Behel from King's College. She'll be talking about how you write an effective personal statement. And finally, we will have an outstanding session from UCL, one of the leading universities in UK, uh, from Arvind Vepa, where he's talking about how do you use the entire UCAS to truly make a competitive uh, application. All right, so let's start with the basic um, idea about how you approach a UK college list. So. Now, when we approach a UK college list, we are really bound by the rules of the UKAS. And that is really that you've got uh, five colleges that you can apply to through the UKAS, right? Among them, you can either apply to Oxford or apply to Cambridge. There are over 120 universities and university colleges to choose for from the other four, though, of course, everybody knows about the same uh, colleges that people end up applying to. So how do you really make that list of five colleges to make sure that you use this very slim opportunity as efficiently as possible? So um, I've sort of tried to give you some options about reach, match, safety. You would be familiar with these words, reach, match, and safety. And uh, what that really means is that a reach college is a college that is a little bit beyond you. You know, you don't quite have uh, top grades if they need that sort of a grade. Uh, not that you don't meet their requirements, but sometimes the requirements are just a base hygiene level and actually it's a much more competitive college. So reach college would be one which would be just a little bit beyond you. A match college would be one where you think that you need the type of student that they'd be looking for. And finally, there are safety colleges, which you know that you more than uh, comfortably meet their requirements and the likelihood that they would uh, want you is very, very high, right? So one approach is, which I think is actually the most intelligent approach is to do one breach college, three matches and one safety, right? Uh, however, sometimes students with um, a pretty decent profile who are quite ambitious might look at two reach colleges, two match and one safety. Only if you have like a fantastic academic profile, because that matters uh, a lot in the UK, would I say that you should look at a more competitive list, like a three reach, one match, one safety sort of a thing there. Then as far as the reach colleges are concerned, you've pretty much met their requirement, but because they're very competitive, therefore you're calling them reach colleges, right? So uh, roughly that would be how I would suggest that you would design a list for the UCAS. Um, now, how do I look at what to populate this list with? So here are some of the main universities in the UK. So, you know, there's uh, Sheffield, Birmingham, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Durham, uh, Newcastle, Edinburgh, St. Andrews, right? Uh, Glasgow, a lot of the big universities, out of which these will be the ones that you would be familiar with as really being the top universities in uh, the UK. Right. Of course, there's Oxford and Cambridge. There's, you know, nothing to um, uh, tell you about that. Everybody knows about Oxford. Then, of course, there's Edinburgh, there's Imperial College, there's UCL, there's King's College, there's LSE, there's Bristol, Warwick and Manchester. 
right? Coming up are also Durham is another one that's coming up strongly. Uh, Glasgow would be coming up strongly. So this would be sort of the range of uh, top colleges that everyone would have heard of and that you would know that you would want to apply to. Is there another lens to look at this whole uh, question about how to look at colleges in the UK? And that uh, lens is really the ranking of these colleges. So often what I find is, okay, uh, so someone's asking me define a high academic profile. So a, a high academic profile would be like a 95 plus that you have through grade 10 and 12 and your grade 11 scores would also be somewhere in the 90s, right? Now that's an academic profile. That's a very safe academic profile with which you can try that, you know, a three dream uh, or three reach, one match, one safety sort of a list. Right. I know it's sounding like a, a really top of the pops, but you, what you need to understand is that while there are many universities in UK, the number of seats per course is really limited. Some places they'll have 14 seats per course, they'll have 36 seats per course. So you can imagine how um, uh, how difficult it is for you to do that. Does 90% work for REACH colleges? Vedika, that would really depend for me to understand what your um reach colleges are what do you see as reach colleges right and what sort of courses you're applying to so of course the whole profile comes together but i'm only talking about a very high academic profile when i was making this point of saying if you want to do three reach one match one safety then what's the sort of um, um grades great profile you would need right so that's the point i was making over there Okay, so now coming back to the rankings. Now, I know everybody's used to looking at top universities and everyone's used to looking um, particularly at QS World, but when it comes to UK, the most, um, the clearest and the most well-informed ranking would really be the Guardian, because the Guardian is a UK ranking agency and newspaper, and they would um, have a very in-depth understanding of what makes a university better or worse. And they've got very in-depth subject-wise rankings that you can look at. And for every subject, you can, of course, you know, sometimes you'll find that in subject-wise ranking, there'll be a university that you've not really heard of, Leeds or Liverpool. You've not really heard of them as being a top university, but you'll find that that university is among the top five or so. And you may not be that comfortable with it. So you can put that wild card in, uh, like one of them in. But typically, your league tables will give you a very good reference point to see how um, these uh, universities do stack up against each other, right? Uh, then the other lens to put on your college list would be course requirements. So the, one of the best things about uh, US university websites is that you, UK, sorry, UK university websites is that you'll find that for every course, there's a very simple, accessible, detailed requirements that's given over there that we want to AAA or they want 85% in CBSC, whatever their requirement is, they want you to have this subject in school, uh, this subject at this level in grades 11 and 12. So the course requirements requirements are really very clear so it's important for you to first check and see that do these course requirements suit you or not um, what does a mean in percentage so you know uh, there are conversion tables that would be available for you uh, on the internet that you can check and see I don't immediately want to uh, hazard my memory or what it means I think a means 85 percent plus but, uh, um, you know, I still would recommend that you would need to. And AAA means that for all three top subjects, right? But I'll recommend that you go to Google and you check out for every college. You look at the requirement and then you go to Google and look at a conversion table and make sense of it, right? So you look at your course requirements, see that you have the subjects that you need. And then you look at the course places as well. You see how many places, most universities in a very transparent way will be telling you this course has so many places. And you see that, is it too competitive for you? Are you just making the uh, requirements on the edge and there are very few seats or are there enough? So you don't want to be competing for this very, very tight admissions process in each and every college that you're applying to. You need to have a couple where you have good leeway where you think that the likelihood of your getting the call is pretty pretty strong okay so one lens that you'll be putting 
to understand uh, the uh, university rankings would be the league tables. And another lens that you might want to put in is the Russell Group uh, University. So, you know, the Russell Group is a self-selected association of 24 world-class research universities. And you'll find a lot of information about this on the internet. The Wikip Wikipedia has a whole listing of them. And uh, finding a Russell Group University will also make it quite comfortable for you. Uh, for you to have, you know, some understanding of uh, quality standards, research standards, particularly R the Russell Group really uh, qualifies a university as being research in intensive. So you intensive. So even if you do not have a very in-depth understanding of the university, you can go by the Russell Group branding and understand that you are in a good place. So these are some of the good uh, Russell Group universities that I've listed out for you here. You'll find this listing very easily on the internet as well, which you can look at when you're trying to take your decision. All right. So other than this, uh, what else do I use to understand how I really make my college list? So one uh, final lens that I want to present to you when you are looking at what colleges to make is to be closer to major cities. Now, you know, there might be some universities that are not really in major cities, but you'll often find that and, you know, they may be really highly ranked and fantastic universities. But as an international student, it makes sense for you to be near um, a major city where there are um, headquarters of companies where there are enough offices for you to go and look out for internship opportunities for you to make networks over three years for you to look at co-op opportunities for you to convert that into a job opportunity because it doesn't just uh, happen in like i was telling you you know unlike e indian universities where you have a very structured placement week and a very structured placement approach you might really be on your own to go and make the connects and find uh, jobs and it therefore really helps for you to be near an industrial center where there are lots of opportunities for you to look at and to access at short notice you know okay let me on the weekend meet such and such person or let me in this week go across and meet some such person right so you might want to look at some of the major cities and see um, that your uh, university is near um, one of them to see that you know at easy accessible distance and ideally in one of those cities so that you find that you are uh, in a good place so london itself has lots of opportunities many of who you will meet today and um, Edinburgh has a lot of opportunities. Again, um, Cardiff, you'll find the University of Cardiff itself. Bristol is a great university in a you know, great city. So it's Manchester, similarly. So you should be able to find universities that will suit you from that perspective of how do I really connect with companies and convert my education into job opportunities as well, right? Okay, so that sort of like an overview of how to approach a UK college list that I wanted to share with you. Uh, also, I think that one of the things that people don't always are not always aware of with UK universities because there are only five places on the UCAS is UCAS clearing that uh, it can happen sometimes that if you do not get an offer from any of the five that you've applied to um, in the UCAS, the story is not over. Uh, there are places that are still on offer through the clearing system, which typically opens in June or July. And then you can apply to the places that are still left in universities. And even if you've not applied originally in the UCAS, you can create a, a clearing application and go ahead and do that. Another uh, angle on applying to the UK, which uh, often I find people are not aware aware of is foundation programs so for instance warwick has a foundation program and bath has a foundation program so if you don't have uh, you know very great grades you don't have the confidence to really apply to a top university but you can apply to the foundation program which is outside the ucas and then they so it's sort of like a bridge program and it prepares you for an application into the same university of course you have to meet certain academic standards you have to meet certain grade standards but if you are able to push yourself well in the next year and in that foundation program make a success of it then you can get admission into that university that you've applied for so it's sort of like one extra bridge year that you use but it also works towards you're making it a 16 year application so that's um, uh, you know which you need sometimes for us universities so it's another very good approach that you might want to take to I'm sorry, to UK universities. Yeah, um, foundation program, when do we apply if somebody's asking me? So the foundation programs, uh, typically the deadlines for those would be 
in uh, May and June, if I'm not mistaken. So they should be in May and June. So typically it can, and you can very well apply for it after you hear from the entire UCAS, you know. So if you hear from the five universities, you've applied to the UCAS and you don't get admission in any of them uh, that you want, then you can consider the foundation route even after that, because those deadlines typically are till June end. Okay. So, um, okay, what's the difference between universities and university colleges? So, in my understanding, there are certain university colleges like University College uh, uh, London, which are under the University of London in a sense. So, they are public uh, universities themselves. I'm not quite clear about the uh, difference. Perhaps we can ask one of them and get a better understanding of that. Okay, so uh, we have um, now, I know that was a pretty quick overview of how to approach UK colleges and we can go into more questions if you like and you can put your questions on the chat box and we can try and answer those questions but I want you to now um, uh, meet our first uh, university representative and speaker of the day which is uh, Sarah Roberts I think Sarah is here hello yes I am hi there you are. Yeah, wonderful to have you here, Sarah. I was just telling them that Imperial is one of the top places in the world for you to uh, get a STEM education. And I know there are several students here who are just waiting to hear from Imperial. So uh, I won't take too much time. And uh, Sarah, do introduce yourself and over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is uh, Sarah and I am the representative for South Asia and the Middle East at uh, Imperial College London. So I'm here to, to represent the university and answer any questions you may have. Um, I also have a, a presentation for you today and hopefully you can now see my screen. And this presentation is going to be on debunking myths uh, on applying to selective UK universities. So I know in today's session, you have a range of different high ranking, excellent universities from across the UK. So hopefully you've got your questions prepared for us. Um, but I'm going to run very quickly through some common myths that we see. Um, being top universities, so Imperial, as I'm sure you've, you've heard, we are ranked currently seventh in the world by the latest QS 2022 rankings. And as um, was just mentioned, we are a STEM set specialist university. So we specialize in science, engineering and medicine. And we have 100 courses around this area. So if um, you are interested in the STEM field, uh, we would, would be a university that you may want to consider. So um, just over the next kind of um, 15 minutes, I'm just going to run through some myths and do put any questions you have for me regarding the myths or about Imperial in the chat box uh, for me to run through. So if you're right for me to start my presentation, Rika, is that all right? Yes, that would be wonderful, Sarah. And people, please keep putting your questions in the chat box so Sarah also has an idea of what you're looking at. Exactly. Perfect. So, um, I will go on to myth one. So I'm a good student and I have excellent exam grades so I can definitely get a place. Now, this is something that we get a lot because our entry requirements for highly ranked and uh, competitive universities are, can be quite high for certain subjects. For example, for certain CBSE or CISE examinations, we may be looking, we are looking for 90 to 92% overall. Uh, and then 95% in specific subject areas. So that may be maths or physics uh, for us. Um, what I'm going to go into here is we are looking for things above and beyond just excellent grade requirements. And even students with perfect scores may not be made an offer to study with us. So I'm just going to go into here. Unfortunately, the grades aren't enough. Grades are important at establishing a minimum level. So as um, was mentioned earlier, you need to be looking at the specific course and the requirements for the course to see that you meet them. So whether that be um, if you're doing A levels or IB, the specific higher levels or subject requirements, or if you're doing the Indian national curriculum, you will need to meet the overall grade requirement. 
And then, for example, depending on the university, they are, may ask for 90, uh, up to 95% in specific subject areas. For universities like Imperial, um, we would be looking for 95% in, at least as 95% in specific areas. So you may be wondering, what are we looking for then? If it's not just about grades, Sarah, what is it about? So what we are looking for within that application and beyond the grades is why you want to study that course. Why do you want to spend the next three to potentially six years of your life studying that grade require, uh, that subject that you're looking into at the moment? We want to be seeing above those the, the fact that you have the minimum grade requirements, that you have an ability to think critically and independently. So for students who are really kind of in classroom, challenging your teachers with ideas, reading articles, doing individual project work, this is something that's really, really important to selective universities. Um, through your exam results and your predicted scores, which are incredibly important, I can see some questions coming in how much do predicted scores matter? They are incredibly important as this is a way for universities like Imperial, um, like the universities today, to gauge whether you do have the academic ability to um, thrive at a university um, such as ours. But above that, we are looking for that extra interest that, that students have uh, demonstrated above and beyond their academic curriculum. So this may be in personal research projects, this may be in TED Talks, uh, competitions. Uh, there are a range of different things that we will be looking for um, to demonstrate in that personal statement. So first of, uh, first of all, when we receive your application, we will be looking for that minimum requirement, uh, the grade requirement that, that your teachers will be submitting through UCAS. But above that, we are going to be looking at you. What makes you a suitable candidate for the course and that university? So by turning up to sessions like this, you're doing the right thing. You're seeing which universities might be a good fit for yourself. Um, as, as, as Rika mentioned, there is a range of different cities and countries to explore. And so it's finding the right fit for yourself. For us, we are also looking for the right fit and the universities like um, Imperial, we are looking for students to be very free thinking um, and, and taking on that extra project work. So above the grades, we are looking for that genuine passion and interest in that specific subject. Different to the US applications, UK universities are very specialist. So you are deciding from the very first year to specialize within a, uh, an initial subject area. Myth number two, I'm not studying UK A-levels, so my application to UK universities will be at a disadvantage. This absolutely is not the truth. Um, so yes, many UK students will be taking their A-levels or IB, but universities in the UK accept a range of different national curriculums from around the world. So for example, at Imperial, we have almost 60% of our students are coming to us from outside of the UK. So India, uh, we've got people from uh, Indonesia, a, a range of different uh, countries. As you can see here for us, um, over 140 nationalities are actually represented. And equal consideration is given to all of those, um, those applicants who are meeting those minimum requirements and meeting uh, by the UCAS deadlines, which I will be going into. So your qualification type isn't important to us, but what is important, as I mentioned in my last slide, is that you are meeting those minimum requirements. And as I see a few more questions coming in, each university will display their entry requirements for that course. So each course will have specific requirements, specific subjects and specific um, grade requirements for whatever curriculum you are taking. So do make sure you are at least meeting, if not exceeding the grade requirements for the universities that you are applying to. So it does take a little bit of research when you are making your five different choices, the five different course choices through UCAS. 
but don't worry if you don't have GCSEs, if you don't have A-levels, universities in the UK are fully prepared for this and ready to consider as we are looking for the strongest applicants from around the world. Myth number three, you have to apply early to receive better offers from competitive universities. Again, this isn't the, uh, the case. In terms of receiving an offer, there is no added advantage to applying earlier. So every application that is received by the UCAS deadline, which for uh, the 2022 UCAS deadline is the 29th of January, we will consider every application that is, um, that is received by this point. Obviously for those who are applying to Oxbridge, so Oxford, Cambridge, and for medicine, you will need to apply by the 15th of October each year. So that deadline has just passed for medics and for uh, students who are looking to apply to Oxford and Cambridge. So applying early does not always mean you will receive a decision sooner and vice versa. So just to highlight, I'm sure universities today will be going over this just to give you an idea of the timeline so that UCAS application does um, open each year in September. You then have those Oxbridge and medicine um, applications by the 15th of October. Then January deadline. So the deadline to uh, this year is the last Wednesday of January. So uh, the majority of all uh, undergraduate degrees will close uh, by 6 p.m. UK time. So this is the important deadline you will want to um, factor in. And then for interviews, universities will have different times when it comes to, uh, to interviews, but these will be happening until mid-March. Um, and then all decisions will be returned by the end, um, the end of March. So this is just an idea of the timeline that you can expect in terms of the UCAS deadline. Now, students will often say, come on, there must be some be benefits to applying earlier. And yes, I do think there are some benefits in terms of being able to focus on your studies. So I, you know, I remember when I was a student applying to universities, I wanted to enjoy my winter break. So I got mine in before the Christmas, the Christmas break at the time, so I could focus on my studies and enjoy the holiday period. So in terms of that kind of mental health, balancing that work life and focusing on those exam results that you will need to make the uh, to, to meet the offers, getting them out of the way sometimes can be useful in terms of focusing on those studies. And yes, in terms of sending out your application, you may be invited to an interview earlier than other applicants, but an interview alone doesn't determine the outcome. So again, all those applications are considered by the January deadline, but you may receive um, an offer or an interview earlier if the application is received earlier. But do not worry if you are applying a little bit later, as long as you are applying by that January deadline. So myth number four, so the application process sounds very scary. What should I say in my interview? So uh, many of the universities, uh, well, many competitive universities will have things like interviews. So it's really important that if you, when you are researching the universities, that you are uh, looking at the application process, looking to see if there are any additional um, examinations that you need to take. For example, for at Imperial, you may need to take a step examination if you are looking at, uh, at mathematics or computing. Uh, there are math papers, if, again, for mathematics as well. So do be looking and researching when you are considering uh, a subject to see what additional tests may be required. One of the things that can be done to, once we have received your application, because our universities are so competitive, we can sometimes have another layer, which is then the interview. And many students really worry about what to say in the interview, and then what they worry about being tested. But I'm here to kind of hopefully make that process a little bit clearer. So why do we have an interview? Because many of our courses, so 
for example, for our computing course, which I can see some people sending um, uh, questions in about, our computing course receives over 22 applications per place. And these applications will be meeting or exceeding the grade requirements. So those are students who are applying with the 92% that is required uh, and the 95% predicted in mathematics. So the interview process, that personal statement, is then used to help get to know the real you and get to know about your communication skills. So we are looking at you to, to kind of speak to you about your academic ability and your potential, uh, examining your motivation and understanding the course. So as you'll know, the UCAS application, that personal statement, is only 47 lines. That's only uh, 4,000 characters, which is very, very uh, short piece of writing. So in the interview, we are looking to, to talk more about your problem solving ability. Student, um, the academics may ask you to solve a problem, so a mathematics or physics based problem, and they're looking not necessarily just for the right answer, they're looking to hear how you solve that problem. So what I really recommend is that you talk through those problem solving abilities, you know, uh, speak to your parents and teachers about explaining how you solve problems and um, looking at different mathematics or physics equations or you know if you're applying for something like English at another university and they have an interview it's really getting to talk through how you think about um, analyzing uh, prose or poetry um, and really um, getting comfortable with expressing yourself um, as, as the academics are really looking to know more about you as an applicant and make sure you are a right the right fit for that university. So what do, you, uh, what do interviews sorry, involve? It's really important to do your research and ask so that you can prepare accordingly for the right, um, for the right interview. So be clear on when it will take place. So for example, at Imperial, sorry for the noise in the background, it may take place from the first week of November until March the following year. So you, it, it's good to know when to expect an interview. How will I be interviewed? So will it be a panel? Uh, will there be one or two academics on the panel? Uh, or will it be multiple mini interviews? So for our medicine um, applicants, there are multiple mini in interviews where they will be going to different stations. Uh, and this is uh, dependent again on the university. So sometimes it could just be one or two academics. Others, there may be di different stations and people for you to talk to. Then finally, Think about what will I be asked, discussion-based questions or predominantly academic and subject-related questions. So for universities um, like Imperial, um, we may focus on predominantly academic and subject-related. So thinking about what's relevant to the course you've applied for, going over um, mathematics equations and, and, and physics things as revision, uh, this is a great way to kind of prepare for that. Uh, and what about the information you have provided in your written application? So remember that personal statement. Remember what you've written in your UCAS application. Uh, don't panic if you don't uh, immediately have an answer to the question. Our academics are looking to challenge you. So they really want to see, um, they don't necessarily want you to go, I know the answer, that's it. No, they're wanting to know how you deal with a problem and what steps do you do to take to solve it. Um, so it's all right to have to pause and think about that. So just to run over how you should prepare, know what to, ex know what to expect, look over kind of possible questions and problem solving, speak to your parents and, and tutors about you and, and your interests and, and really explore how you have got to this point of, about your interests and that, that kind of focus in um, engineering or mathematics or English, really think about you and how you've ended up at this point. Reread the entire UCAS application. So be familiar with what you mentioned. Um, be comfortable uh, with those, um, with the application as academics may be interested to, to explore more what you mentioned in that initial application. 
explore the subject and practice. We read over articles that you may have read. Be interested in, and show your passion in that subject. These academics who you're meeting will have a shared passion as you. That's why you've been called to interview. So do make sure you explore those passions and ask questions. You know, read what's on the, um, the website. Make sure that you are doing your research and, and that the questions that you're asking aren't initially on the website, um, as the academic might think you haven't prepared for, for the initial imperial or whatever university you're applying to. Be punctual, so be on time, be ready, test your internet connection and be authentic, be yourself. Don't worry about in your application, uh, writing the biggest words, you know, clicking on synonyms and making your, your application, you know, too difficult uh, to read. Be you, be yourself, be authentic. Then the final myth that I've got here to share with you, uh, and this is something that I see a lot, uh, especially with students who are incredibly active in India. I sometimes don't know how students can fit it all in above their academics, doing a range of different extracurricular activities. But something I get asked a lot is, I need to do a ton of supercurricular activities to impress the admissions tutor. And this isn't the case. So your academic interests for competitive universities play a more significant role. What is really important in your personal statement and in your extracurricular, you know, in the interview to be talking about and thinking about is what are the activities that you've done? What are the benefits and the skills that I have gained? And how will this prepare me for the course? So I meet a lot of amazing students who have done work experience, extracurricular activities, competitions. They've performed the best in their class. They're head boy, head girl. They lead the debate team. They're captain of the football team or cricket team. And they want to include everything in their application and talk about everything in their interview. But what your, your application, what your timing to do is to think more about what are the skills that are going to be ben beneficial to, to the university and to the course that you're applying to. That, that's not to say that we're not interested in your uh, football or uh, in your ability to compete at a national level, but we want to know what you've learned, whether that be teamwork, whether that be time management, that could be the ability to kind of um, give feedback to peers, uh, problem solving. There are a range of different things that your supercurricular activity can give you in um, the application process for a course. For example, one of our um, med students, she played a traditional um, Indian musical instrument and she included in her uh, application the dexterity that she needed to play the instrument would then lead um, to the dexterity that she would need as a surgeon, which was her career goal. She, so she was linking her playing a musical instrument for years to the skills that she would need as a surgeon. So really thinking about what you're interested in, what your skills are, and then how they apply. So always linking them back. Um, so that's kind of uh, some of the myths that I've, that I've drawn about. And I know that you're going to hear from some fantastic institutions today. What I want to kind of conclude this with is, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the research now and early on and finding the right fit for you is above all the most important thing. Each of the universities today will be coming from different cities um, around the UK and each have different characters and, and it's about finding the right fit for yourself. Do your research on the specific course, courses. Mechanical engineering at Imperial is going to be very different to mechanical engineering at another university. So making sure that you are exploring how the university teaches uh, and, and that that's the right fit for you. For Imperial, we are incredi an incredibly project-based university. So students are really looking to get hands-on, uh, do workshops, uh, group work, lab work, um, incredibly practical ways of implementing engineering, mathematics or medicine. But that's not for everybody. Um, London, again, is a fantastic stu uh, student city. It's the number one uh, student city, again, for the second year in a row. 
via the QS world rankings. But again, it's not a city for everybody, perhaps. If you're looking for a quieter uh, university life, a more kind of rural experience, or maybe you just want a smaller city feel. There are fantastic cities. I know we can mention Bristol, a fantastic city for students. I love um, London. London's a fantastic place to get, to take advantage of the networking opportunities, um, take advantage of the, the research and museums, the culture. It's an incredibly diverse and welcoming city. Uh, but again, for some students who are looking for a quieter student life, it may be overwhelming for those students. So do your research. Now, I want to leave enough time to, to answer some of the questions that have come in. So if you are interested in finding out more, um, please do scan the, the barcode here uh, and register for more updates. We have open days, virtual tours, and I know that you'll be exploring these from a range of different universities. So um, I, I really do welcome you to chat to our students, hear about what it's really like at Imperial from the student perspective as well. Um, so I can see a, a range of different questions coming in. Um, so I will look at those now. So thank you for sending those in. So I'll start. Perhaps I can direct some of these questions to you, Sarah, because I see sure. people writing and some of them have sent me the questions as well. So one question that I've seen three or four times now is about this difference between a three-year engineering degree in UK as opposed to a four-year degree in other countries. And mm -hmm. sort of like a, a part B of this is the four-year master's in engineering degree, right? So if you could tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. So in the UK, uh, very different to the US. So the standard bachelor of any course, so a bachelor's degree in the UK, if you're doing the standard route, is three years. So um, it, no matter what course you're looking at, whether that be English, um, you know, mathematics, uh, bachelor's degree is a three-year course. Now, not all of, at Imperial, most of the courses that we offer with engineering, so our, um, our engineering courses, most are a four-year program, which is the Masters of Engineering. Some of our engineering programs are three years, so you'd be graduating with a Bachelor's of Engineering. Now, the difference specifically with engineering is to do with accreditation. So with the four year program, what's really important when you are exploring uh, engineering degrees is who they are accredited with. So if you are looking to be um, a, a chartered engineer, which um, requires years of accreditation and work experience overall from the journey of your career, so um, from kind of your um, high school up to fully accreditation, full accreditation as an engineer. This process takes at least 10 years. Um, if you are looking to go down the fully chartered route, you will need various accreditation from various boards. So the four year um, engineering, masters of engineering will work towards various accreditation. So that is what you're gaining uh, within that four-year program. So you've got your bachelor's degree and then you have in your um, the fourth year is the integrated master's that will work towards accreditation depending on the degree, um, depending on the engineering degree. And you can find this on each university uh, page, which uh, bodies they will be accredited by. So it might be the Institute of Technology if you're doing computing. It might be um, a, a range of different accreditation depending on the engineering degree. So yes, if there is a three-year program, the, the Bachelor's of Engineering, it won't have that, that first accreditation um, for the that the Masters will provide you with. Right. No, I think that's what a lot of students wanted to know. And even for me, you know, this has given me a lot of clarity. So thank you very much for that. Um, now, uh, there's this question saying, are you only offering STEM courses or there, there are courses for commerce background? I think there are courses in mathematics, right? Which is students. Yeah, that's correct. So we have maths. Uh, we have maths with statistics, sorry, statistics uh, and maths 
with finance, but we don't as of yet have a specific economics or e-commerce degree programme. Our degree programmes are very much um, along the lines of the mathematics focus. Um, in 2023, we are going to be releasing a business course, which will have those kind of um, uh, commerce but also linked to mathematics. So it is really important for uh, students considering Imperial. And if you are looking at next, you know, the 2023 entry, we will have a more business related course. But again, it's very important to have that strength in mathematics. Uh, so the, at least the 95% in CBSE or CISCE, if that's the curriculum that you're, that you're taking. Right. No, a math and finance combination sounds like what you really need to enter the world of business today because, you know, all of it is very data based and, you know, mathematics. Absolutely. Is to that. So I think a lot of students who are looking at business courses would, unless, of course, you're looking at a pure uh, people based business course like a marketing or a human resources. But if you're looking at anything uh, related to data or finance, then I think that course sounds very, very relevant. Now, there's one question here which I actually really like. Uh, the student is asking, what kind of extracurricular activities might you be looking for a student who's applying for math and com computer science? So do you have any examples? You know, what, what kind of things do students do? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I really like that because it's not as, you know, perhaps as hands on necessarily as um, as engineering, for example. What's really important, I think, with competitive universities is that forward thinking, that problem solving. So it's demonstrating your ability to think and apply mathematics to every, the everyday world. What you'll be doing at university is, is taking mathematics and, and solving problems, uh, applying them to you know, theories and um, testing those out. So what admissions tutors are going to be doing is, is looking to see what problems you've solved, how you've kind of used mathematics um, at, above and beyond you know, your your curriculum. Um, someone that I spoke to in their application uh, looked at Rubik's cubes and solving Rubik's cubes with mathematical equations and, 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 and applying that those mathematics um, into, um, into that, that kind of love of Rubik's cubes, for example. It's, I mean, math, it, others, it's the mathematics of music or, you know, whatever your interests are some you know have taken it upon them to kind of um especially with things like computing uh, learn about coding or um a computing language for example again it's um there's no one specific extracurricular activity it might just be further reading it might be research you know looking into um exploring something that was mentioned in your class or project and then taking that a little bit further and doing your own project. I know that over the pandemic students weren't able to get work experience or do this but students actually you know conducted their own research did their own kind of um, experiments from home and what Imperial you know students who come to Imperial are like they're very free thinking and they are getting engaged and and I think over this time, it's really worth thinking, why are you interested in studying a subject like mathematics and how are you going to apply that to the real world? Yeah, in fact, I found students to do some very interesting stuff with mathematics. Now that you mentioned music, I remember I had a student who was learning this Indian classical dance, dance form called Kathak which has a lot of beats and she said that you know and I, the way those beats sort of have a mathematical pattern to yes. them you know so exactly that really interesting and the extra reading you know that's that's a lot for you to pick up some area within mathematics that you like and then if you just open the world of ted talks for example you know you'll find so many interesting ideas that's so true it's so true something as simple as ted talks i mean i think people get worried about oh i don't do enough i'm not you know i'm not doing um a hundred different activities we're not looking for that. We are looking for your interest, your genuine interest in that subject. Um, and, and yeah, exactly that dance and, and applying that to mathematics or, or the research, the articles and that thing, it's showing that interest. 
Right, absolutely. No, that sounds like uh, some very, very good ideas. And, uh, you know, perhaps students can build on that. So let me ask you a question that I sort of, you know, when, uh, you, uh, when I was introducing your thing, I said that she's going to debunk some myths. So uh, this whole thing about grades in uh, Imperial, that do you think that uh, what would be the percentage of getting students in who would not have like a 95% plus in a CBSC or a ICSC? Do you think that's a very rare thing and grades become a kind of a hygiene factor? So a very good question. The minim meeting the minimum grades is incredibly important. This is minimum. This is the absolute minimum. So that's so to give you the example of Imperial, the overall, depending on the subject, will be between 90 to 92 percent overall and 95 percent in specific subject areas, whether that be chemistry, maths or physics, for example. You do need to be meeting the minimum. Um, on our website, we do um, display the minimum grade requirements, but sometimes, depending on the course, you may be asked above the minimum requirements. and if you are not looking to at least meet that minimum predicted grade requirement, I would consider other universities outside of Imperial, because for us, we do have students who are, the students who are applying to us will be meeting, if not exceeding it. That's not to say we are looking for perfect 95%, you know, 95% overall, uh, we just need, we do need you to be meeting the minimum, but we, we're not necessarily asking you to exceed the minimum in every case, as once you have met the minimum requirements, we will then be looking at your personal statement, we will be looking at your teacher's reference, we will then be looking, if you're strong enough, you will then look at your interviews and your test scores. But I know sometimes it can be frustrating because some students will say I'm just one percent off or I'm just two percent off once you arrive at university we really do want to make sure that you're going to thrive and enjoy and, and really make the most of your experience and for students who aren't quite meeting the, the entry requirements these are set because it is academically challenging being at a university like Imperial we want to make sure that the students who are arriving are going to enjoy the process and, and really go from strength to strength. So if you are short of the entry requirements, do consider other universities. There are so many fantastic universities that are the right that are going to be the right fit for you. If the reason that the entry requirements are so high is because that level continues and only increases once you go, uh, once you continue. University is a lot more about independent thinking, independent project work. And if you are joining a university and going to struggle with the academic, you know, uh, the academic challenge of being here, I have to be very honest, it's, it's difficult sometimes coming to a university like Imperial because we attract students who have been the top of their class for many, many years. But then you're also joining everybody else who is top of the class. And sometimes that can be really, really mentally difficult because you're all of a sudden, you know, getting on to your next challenge. So I would say if you're not meeting, you know, the minimum requirements, do consider other universities because, it, you know, just because the, the, the challenge of and, and the competitive nature of the programs, this is a minimum for, for our universities. Well, thank you. That was, I think, a very clear and a very straightforward picture for students to get. So, you know, you have a very clear idea of what you can really expect and why it's uh, the way it is. So I know you're in a hurry, Sarah. There are a couple of questions because I know you had limited time and thank you for making the time for us. So I'll quickly run you through the uh, couple more questions I find yes. in the chat. One is about SAT and ACT scores. So uh, students do submit them and the UCAS allows you to. How much does this influence your understanding of the student? So for Imperial, it's not important. It, this isn't something that we really consider. We look at the AP scores. So if you're doing um, the American curriculum, um, we have uh, AP scores that we look at. But for SATs, this isn't something that we really consider um, with the application process. 
right okay all right so if, if a student is want is looking at making their application more competitive then what they would be better off doing the ap's rather than doing the sap that's and correct that's okay. correct it wouldn't make the the uh, the application more competitive to do sat's Okay, that that makes a lot of sense and you know at times especially with oxford and cambridge you know a lot of um, students and counselors believe that uh, an a cbsc and an icsc doesn't really prepare you that uh, you know ib or igcsc is what they'd be looking at uh, with imperial have you seen that sort of a, a bend towards more international curricula or have you seen people uh, coming in from a cbsc icsc a lot also i don't we know have yeah, we have quite a lot of students coming in from the CBSE uh, because we understand the academic rigour that it takes to complete these national boards. Um, and we're not asking for low requirements as, you know, 95% is very hard to achieve. So in terms of the students that we accept, obviously with uh, the A-levels A and IB are very um, prominent because they are the curriculums that, that are prevalent in the UK and they they are international qualifications but for students coming from India we have a range of students coming from the CBSE and CISE curriculums. Wonderful and the last one for you Sarah here is still about the four-year and the five-year master's degree that what would be the difference between a four-year and a five-year degree and can I start off with the four-year and then change to the five-year? Yeah that's a great question so uh, with the if when you're applying for a course there's often flexibility within the university so the five-year programs that you'll see um, this is for students who want to do maybe a placement uh, an extra placement year or a year abroad so gaining more experience before they go into the world of work um, so that's something that's really important to pay attention to um, the four-year program so you're getting that accreditation it's the same accreditation usually with the five-year program. Four years are more common, but some students do like to do a year abroad and a, a placement year as well before graduating. So they may want to take that five-year program, but it's not as common as the four-year um, Masters of Engineering. Um, so there's not much difference other than the, pla the extra placement year or year abroad. Right. All right. That really gives us a, a very, very good picture. And thank you very much, Sarah, for all your time and for answering each question in so much detail and with so much frankness. I think people have got a lot of answers over here. And I really hope that some uh, brilliant STEM students and some aspiring engineers are able to make it to Imperial and uh, can prepare themselves the way you've guided them to do. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much to everyone who's joined and thank you for having me today and enjoy the rest of the excellent event. I know there are fantastic institutions joining today. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a lovely day. And have a great weekend. All right, so after that, a uh, view of uh, Imperial and everything that Imperial has to offer and a view of the competitiveness of that application. Now you have a view uh, from completely the, the different, a different end of the country, which is from St. Andrews at Scotland. And we've got Veer Anand here with us. And Veer is a director of the Global Center for the University of St. Andrews in India. And he also studied at St. Andrews. So he can really give you a very, very good view of the university. But very interestingly, what he'll be talking about also is about the flexible Scottish degree. Like I was telling you, Scotland approaches education slightly differently. And he'll be looking at the flexible Scottish degree and give you a view about careers in the UK. So after you study in the UK, what potential career opportunities does the country offer you. I uh, will hand this over to Veer then to take you through all of this. We're waiting impatiently and thank you so much Veer for joining us. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you Richard. Great to be here and uh, happy to share my thoughts and views on, on Scottish education in general. So I'll, I'll start off with that. Richard, just give me a thumbs up if you can see the slide. Yeah, we can see it. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, you know, um, let me give you a little bit of information about me. I think it, it helps the context. So uh, my name is V, as you can see, I'm the director here at the Global Office in India, but um, I studied in Delhi. I studied at the Sriram School. So, so uh, I'm a product of, of the Indian education system. I then went and did my bachelor's at St. Andrews. So 
you know, I've got a perspective uh, which is similar to maybe some of, uh, you know, the students here and thinking of applying. So, um, so I'm quite happy at the end of uh, the 20 minutes to answer all sorts of questions, you know, even if it isn't directly about St. Andrews, but my student journey, I'm quite happy to share my thoughts as well. So I think before we start, just to give you a context of where Scotland is, and I think the, the reason I do this is because we often think of the United Kingdom as England. And when we think of England, we think of the three-year education structure. And, and that's what uh, you know, uh, Mrs. Richard was just talking about. But just bear in mind that the UK is beyond England. It has Scotland, it has Wales, it has Northern Ireland, and each follows a different legal and educational system. So while your visa might be the same, while in terms of traveling through the UK, there's no restriction for you, you could go and work in London or in Wales, um, despite studying in Scotland, but just do keep in mind that there is a little bit more to the UK uh, than what's normally perceived as just England. Um, and also, you know, there's six ancient universities in the UK and four out of these are in Scotland. So when we talk about Scotland as a quality in, uh, country for, for education, uh, you know, its, its history dates back to the ancient universities. And if you look at uh, the tradition and culture in, in Scotland is very welcoming and has been for centuries. Uh, for students who want to come and study in the United Kingdom. So Scotland has about 19 universities uh, and across the UK, we've got about, you know, 200, 250 and, and more than that yet, uh, a lot of the 19 rank very highly. So just to, just to tell you, you know, that you, Scotland is actually a hub for education when we talk about quali quality education in the UK. So what I'll discuss today and in no order as such, but, uh, you know, I'll get through the Scottish degree system. I think that's why I'm here and I'll give you examples of why this is important for some of you. Uh, it is different from what you may think. Um, so I'll give you an example of some types of institutes. I'll also talk about careers in the UK, mainly the graduate route. So in the UK now we have the graduate route, which allows students to stay back for two years after graduating without uh, you know, the need of a sponsor, for example, or any minimum uh, criteria in terms of how much you should be earning. So I'll, I'll, I'll just share some thoughts on the graduate route as well and then also talk to you a little bit about St. Andrews. So generally, of course, with Scotland, you know, you've got Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, uh, St. Andrews, some, some really, really historic sites, some beautiful sites, and it's a very welcoming country. So um, there's a lot to do in Scotland in general. You know, this is an a cappella group, for example, performing at the Fringe. It's one of the biggest festivals that we have uh, in the world, the Edinburgh Fringe. Um, so it's, it's a really good place to be, and there's a lot to do in Scotland beyond uh, beyond your university life as well. So I'll move on very swiftly, you know, due to limitations in time, but you know, the degree structure is really what sets Scotland apart in the United Kingdom. So um, I'll go back to this slide, but I want to share this and spend a few minutes on this. When we look at the world generally right now, we've got England, which is very similar to India. It's a three year structure. You declare what you want to study at the beginning of uh, your degree, and that is what you study. Okay, so it's in India, we do a BCom or, or you know, a BTEC and you stick to that. That's what you want to do. You finish in three years. The world largely is a lot more uh, flexible in its approach and it's a four-year degree, whether we look at the US, we look at Canada, we look at Australia and we look at Scotland, for example. It's a four-year degree structure. So the other extreme in the world that we find today is the US system. We can call it liberal arts and sciences. Uh, and, and these normally have a core curriculum. So you take a mathematics, you can uh, take a social science, a language, you can take many different groups of subjects. You don't have to know what you want to study. Um, and so it's a great program if you want to make use of the breadth of education. Scotland sits somewhere in between these two. So if you're a student who's applying to the US for you know, the flexibility and think that you know I'm not sure of what I want to study and the UK doesn't offer me that choice, that's where Scotland comes into play. So being closer to home, being in the United Kingdom with the culture, which is which is a little bit more similar to, to India and having that comfort, you can still get the flexible degree structure that, that is similar to the US while maintaining uh, you know, the, the benefits of being in the United Kingdom. So what we do in Scotland is you declare a major, but normally you can take up two more subjects uh, with your major. And so for two years, you essentially study these variety of subjects. And in third and fourth year, you then specialize in what you want to study. So unlike the US, we don't, we don't say any of these, these subjects are mandatory for you. 
uh, you can take up uh, you know a variety of different subjects and then proceed so important to keep in mind that within the uk context you still can get a four year degree um, and that flexibility and breadth of education as well so which program fits what student in my experience if you're very very sure of exactly what you want to do um, and this is where we talk about the english system you talk about the a levels it's very very uh, detailed and specific even in your school education and so it lends itself very well for the three education where you where you know exactly what you want to study if you're doing the ib you're doing the isc cbsc different different uh, boards that are more broad at the school level we find that actually uh, you know a four year system might actually be more beneficial to you so if you're confused between studying a biology or a history or a mathematics then maybe look at the us liberal arts system if you know exactly what you want to study go for england but actually scotland is a sweet spot in the middle where you might have a rough idea of what you want to study but not exactly know what you want to study um and you like two three different subjects that's where the scottish program can really stand out for a student like that so just remember obviously i'm generalizing information here you know the us has 3 4000 universities so it's not specific to everyone but uh, this is just to give you a sense of the different kinds of structures and even within scotland i'll share the way we do our degree and then other scottish universities might differ so always always take a look individually at universities but i wanted to give you a general sense of uh, where we sit in the world so we do a four year degree like i said in um, in scotland uh, you can have some uh, degrees which are three years in length for example when we talk about a, a direct entry into second year for students who maybe already have that ex, that that academic experience uh, it might become a three year degree for you or it becomes a five year degree if you do an integrated masters or what some universities may call a sandwich program or in the languages for example so something you can keep in mind there for those looking at medical programs we're looking at a six year degree um uh, for your medicine program now while a lot of you may not be looking at post graduate courses when it comes to post graduate courses it's very similar across the uk so there's no difference in terms of the scottish degree or the english degree it is generally a one year program uh, across the uk um and two years if you're doing an mphil with research and your masters and of course for a phd it can be slightly longer another very interesting aspect is is uh, in scotland and some of the ancient universities in england as well you'll find the ba degree called an ma it's just ancient terminology it's been going on for a while so don't get confused with that if you look at some some degrees that are undergraduate and ma in their terminology uh, it is a bachelor's degree at least for us so um that's a little bit about the scottish degree structure and i don't know richard do we want to take questions about scotland now or just wait for the end of of uh, the session thank you on mute so richa i think you're on mute i'm so sorry <laughs> absolutely no i i was on mute so okay there's one general question which i think would relate to what you were talking about which is yep. that you know uh, what's the masters degree called if the bachelors is called a, ma so you're saying ma is the bachelors degree so what would the masters degree be called no really good question so if a university is using that ancient terminology where the ba is called an ma then the ma in in that sense would be called an m lit uh and so that's something that you would find in st andrews even i think oxford uses some of the same terminology so um that's what it will be called it's, it's uh, an that gives us a lot of clarity yeah okay great but when great. one applies abroad with that four year uh, like if one applies to the us with that four year masters or with a five year masters then does it appear as a masters to them or they would read it as a bachelors i mean i'm wondering how they would be seeing it yep so so um so the us tends to have a good understanding of this and also they'll go through the transcript so i actually think uh, one of the reasons why we at st andrews for example have the largest us population i think is actually for the four year degree because um it's four academic years and it helps them if they want to do a masters in canada or the us it actually is a program which is then better suited to their own uh degree structure so it becomes a little bit easier in their transition um and so um they would they would know that because they they go through uh, those details 
but you know there's very few of us in the ancient university world that still use the terminology but since it is uh, there uh, i thought i'll mention it in any case yes absolutely i think the other questions relate to saint andrew so i'll wait for you to take tell us a little bit more about the university and then we'll come to specific questions about the university brilliant brilliant i'll do that then. thank you so um yeah just talking a little bit about saint andrews i'll give you a brief tour so this is what saint andrews looks like so it's an absolutely stunning town built in uh, you know uh, the university dates back to 1413 but the town is much older so we've got the cathedral ruins we've got you know uh, the university and town growing up together in this in this amazing way um and so lots of tradition lots of culture with st andrews and and we've got the beach and anyone interested in golf the golf course so just to give you a sense of what things looked like now when you're looking at uh, the uk uh, in general i think um i've been able to characterize you universities in two groups i think you've got the universities that are you know campus style i won't call them campus because there's no wall here but you know they they built in smaller towns and the university dominates the towns and then you've got city based university so the student experience is very different in these two groups so when you look at a st andrews with very very campus like you know it takes only 25 minutes to walk from you know one end to the other so you don't need to worry about cars and transport you know students walk or cycle uh, everywhere and so um similarly oxford cambridge durham you've got the older style campus style universities and then you've got of course the likes of a Uh, imperial you were just listening to you've got kings and so on in london or manchester the city style so you know you're in a city um, and the student experience is likely to be very different so for st andrew students you know you see the three streets there walk through those streets you'll bump into a professor you'll bump into five friends that's very common so it's it's interesting and it's it's your life is surrounded by activities that that happen at the university so this is just to give you a visual here it's an absolutely beautiful town very comfortable very safe and it's campus style in its in its um, in its approach so when we talk about st andrews i've mentioned this but we've got about 22000 residents and and 10000 of those residents are students so one in two people you meet on the streets are likely to be uh, associated with us in some way or the other um we are very very diverse and and i want to say this with uh, supporting this with we are not dominated by any one nationality so when we talk about let's say being 40% international and and from outside the uk is where our population comes from you know you'd think it's dominated by let's say indians chinese koreans for example but our largest international population is from the us almost 17% so when we talk about 130 different nationalities we actually mean there's there's a very very strong representation there you know indians would be only about 5% i would say at this point uh, and and so you know it's not dominated by just one group uh, and i think that's very important when we talk about diversity because it's easy to say 40 50 60% international but if there's only indians in those 60% then then that's not actually creating a very diverse cohort for you to learn from so similarly this extends to our academics our academics come from all over the world uh, and they're hired on the basis of their international research experience and reputation so we're a research led university uh, where academics are conducting research and they're bringing it to the classroom so that extends to a great global network alumni networks are very important today uh, and i think that is something that anyone applying abroad should consider so having a good global alumni network where you can get that support from from people who have been to university with you and 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 in years prior to when you were there i think it just creates a very very nice informal mentorship model for you so the league tables it it, it is important even though i i try and i try and say you know use it as an indicator rather than your google maps uh, so if someone is number 3 or number 4 it doesn't mean they're any better or worse because we see these changing but i understand there is relevance to league tables today what we actually are really proud of is called the national student survey so this is government endorsed done by students who are graduating and so um you know it's student based it's student student centric and it's about their experience over the last four years we've been number one for almost 10 out of the last 13 years so you know despite being in a smaller town and not in a city you see that students actually have a very very good experience um and almost in 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 other ways a better experience because they're being able to engage with the university whereas 
sometimes uh, that can't happen in a city. And of course, we just got the best news is with we've created history by actually being ranked the best in the UK this year by the by the good university guide ahead of Oxford and Cambridge, which is the first time that a new university has done that. Uh, but otherwise, you know, over the last many years, we're constantly in the top three or four, depending on which ranking you look at. So obviously the reputation is there. That's why we're here today with, you know, other top universities. Uh, but just to say that, you know, again, coming back to that question of Scotland, um, that, uh, you know, you do have brilliant universities across the UK and not just in, in London or in England. So what studying in St. Andrews looks like, and, and we've got a mixture of different ways of teaching. So we'll have a very, very strong students to staff ratio. We've got about 11 students to an academic, so very small class sizes. And the way that you study is, is spread out through the semester. So a lot of support for you, but also focus on independent learning, independent research, and you'll be doing research from year one. Uh, and that's an important aspect for us as well. So what we do when we get an application is we place you into one of our four faculties. So we have got the arts faculty, the science, medicine, and divinity, uh, and that's where we would place you. Just take a look at the screen. You know, I won't go through all the subjects, but these are the, the larger head headlines that we have. And of course, within these subjects, you'll have different specializations, but you know, you can see the interesting group of subjects there is the cross faculty. So these can be done both in the sciences or the arts and, and the subject will remain the same, but what else you might want to study, and this goes back to the flexibility that Scotland offers you uh, is, is where the faculty will, will be important. So example, I had applied for economics and philosophy in the arts faculty, uh, and I took up management as well. Equally, if I wanted to do economics with computer science, then I would apply for an economics in the science faculty because I wanted to take up a subject which is in the science faculty. So your faculty for the cross faculties isn't, isn't as important, but if you're looking at studying certain science or art subjects that are not in the cross faculty, that's what will determine which faculty that you want to be in. And it goes without saying, we have a really good variety of combinations that you can take up. So if you wanted to study Arabic with management, economics and psychology, you've got a wide range of joint degree options that you can take a look at as well. So this is what it looks like for the arts faculty. Um, and just to give you a visual, it's, it's different, you know, to, to what you might have heard. So, you know, you apply for three subjects uh, and then you take up three subjects again in your second year. You can drop up to two if you want to. So you can actually create a great model of taking five subjects, different knowledge bases coming into play. So you've got that breadth and flexibility. And after you finish your second year, we ask you, okay, do you want to stick to what you applied for? Do you want to maybe do a joint honors? Or, uh, you know, it may be that uh, you want to change your mind. I actually changed my mind. So I'd applied for economics and philosophy. I ended up graduating in management. So about 40% of our students actually graduate in a different degree than what they applied for. And so it's important, again, bringing back the Scottish flexibility that we have. So here's another example with some subjects so that it's easier for you to grasp the concept. So someone here applying for ancient history, Spanish, and taking up Spanish and philosophy. And actually deciding, you know, I never studied this in school, but I'm loving this combination and they decide to do a joint honors in it. Um, and so that's completely fine. But equally, they could have continued with ancient history, maybe use Spanish as a way to enhance their CV uh, in, for their careers and things like that. So it still has benefit, even if you don't change your mind. When we talk about the science faculty, very, very similar, but we start specializing a little bit sooner. Um, I know I've run out a little bit on time, uh, Richard, so I'll skim through a few of these slides and still take some questions in, in, in a few minutes, but remember to go through. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, we don't worry. Yep. This is extremely interesting and it's very enlightening. So please tell great. us all of this. And you're answering great. a lot of people's questions anyway. Great, great. So I think entry requirement wise, take a look at the website. We've got some 10th grade requirements. We look at your progression from, from your ninth grade onwards, and there'll be some subject specific requirements as well. So I don't know that I'm sure there's people here from all sorts of different boards, but when we look at the CBSC or ISC, we're looking at, you know, a minimum 90% average across all your subjects. And then depending on the subjects that you take um, and want to study, we might have some specific subject requirements. So for example, computer science, you need a 90% overall, but you need a 90 and above in mathematics as well. So you need to meet subject requirements, you'll have the overall requirements, and then you'll have some basic requirements in the 10th grade. So 
you know, four great universities here, but also that means it's going to be competitive as well. Similarly, for the IB or A-levels, it's very simple. Go onto the website. It's very, very clearly mentioned. So the range is between 36 to 38 for the IB. Most, are sub, most of our, them would be 38, and there would be some HL and SL requirements as well. So important to take a look at the individual subject in detail so that you meet all the requirements that there are. So cost-wise, we're looking at about 25,000 pounds of tuition fee for a year. Uh, and and um, accommodation ranges from about four to 10,000, depending on whether you want your own room or bathroom and, and food made for you. So these are all annual figures uh, that you're looking at. And I think um, an important aspect there to, to mention is scholarships. So we've got a wide range of scholarships, but because we're so competitive, we don't automatically give students scholarships. So you first apply, and then within a few days of applying, we'll send you a student ID, and then you can apply for multiple scholarships that you think you're eligible for. Very important, we're not like the US where you'll be disadvantaged. So if you apply for a scholarship, it's completely separate from your application. So there's no disadvantage in applying for scholarships. So we've got need-based and merit-based scholarships that you can apply for and um, be considered for. So if you do feel that you need some support and there is a scholarship you're eligible for, please do apply for it. It, it won't be a disadvantage to you at all. So club societies, we've got a wide range of them. Uh, we've just renovated the sports center as well. So, so a lot of support uh, that we give to our students to engage at every level and create their, their experience when it comes to CVs and things like that, but also continue with their clubs and sports as they find um, useful to them. You know, lastly, I think I'll, I'll, I love to sort of give, give an experience here, but you know, one thing that an older university can give you is lots of history and tradition, you know? So walking down cobble streets where, you know, you've had Nobel laureates and things like that, it is a special feeling. I was lucky enough to do it. But one of the academic families is the tradition that I love. It's third years adopting first years as the academic kids. It's a really nice informal mentorship model. You've got brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, and it just becomes a really, really nice mentorship model. But there's a lot of tradition um, that, that you haven't seen at least it's been going on for centuries now. Uh, study abroad opportunities, I think, of course, uh, look at the website. We've got great partners all over the world. If you do want to take uh, a study abroad option, um, you normally would do this in your third year, but the process would start to, a bit earlier to make sure that we're picking the right candidates. Um, moving on to careers. So like I said earlier, the graduate immigration route is now open. So you can be unsponsored and stay back for two years as an undergraduate student post the completion of your degree. Very important to know the details about this program. So for example, you don't apply while you're studying. You apply once you've got your final transcripts. That's when you would apply. You still have to be on your student visa and then you can get that extension. So there's no minimum salary requirement or caps or numbers. And so you don't need to find a job. You can actually find a job whilst on the visa. So actually it's now put the UK in a certain sense at par with what a lot of the world is offering as stay back opportunities as well. My advice is please don't go through links that are not verified. You know, gov.uk is the UK site uh, where you'll find a lot of this information. As far as our careers goes at St. Andrews, we provide a lot of support and, and this isn't this isn't one off. It's it's provided by a lot of the top universities. Uh, but you know, make use of it. There will be career services, there'll be fairs, there'll be companies coming to you. Make use of those those networking opportunities uh, so that you are best placed to find a job at the end of your education. So um that's that's me, Richard. I think there's some questions I can see and uh, Hopefully I've left some time for at least a few of those questions. So again, thank you for having me. Great uh, to be here. And uh, hopefully this helps some of the students. But for those who want to find an alternative to you know, the US liberal arts model, do look at Scotland. There's some brilliant universities, including ours uh, as well. No, absolutely. And I uh, learned a lot from uh, this as well, uh, especially the flexibility of the degree and the uh, approach to scholarships. Uh, one of the questions here, and thank you for spending a little bit of uh, leaving a little bit of time because I do think people have questions. One of them is that if a student meets all the requirements for subjects and overall, is it sort of almost sure that they will be offered admission? <laughs> you know, um... yeah, is 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 critical planning to go back to university? <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, asking on behalf of one of the students. <laughs> so, um, so no, I think I think uh, it's not an Indian style cutoff. So these are general requirements. So if you don't meet um, the requirements, it's not like your application won't be read. But you know that is what the conditional offer will be. So you need to be close enough for us to make any decision. The second aspect is these are not cut off, so they look holistically, which means even if you have a ninety-five percent, but your personal statement is not up to the mark, we will not make an offer. So these are general requirements. These are not cut off style requirements as we have in India. So you want to meet these requirements. That's important, but you also want to make sure that other aspects of your application are strong as well, because when it comes to competitive universities and certainly the four that you have today, meeting grades is just one criteria. We are often unfortunately looking at reasons to reject people rather than take them in at this stage, and you don't want to give us a reason. So not India cutoff style, holistic approach, and all aspects of your application will make a difference to the decision. Right. One last question for you, Veer, uh, which is about this careers in UK idea that uh, I, I really like that the fact that you said that, you know, 96 percent of students are able to find uh, some sort of a work opportunity within those six months and actually use that graduate route and two year post study work visa that they're getting. Yeah. Post that, you would need to be sponsored by somebody and then that would sort of count for if you want to stay back in the UK towards the five years of working there. Yeah. So uh, how difficult is, do, do you think it is for Indian students? I know this is a rather large and somewhat vague question, yeah, but yeah. how difficult is it for students to really convert that two-year work experience on a visa into a job offer where someone might sponsor them to stay back and work? No, I think really great question. And I should have clarified that, Richa. It is the 96% is actually a stat before the graduate route. So this isn't taking the graduate route into account because the first batch that have applied for the graduate route, they're applying now. So we don't have that data just yet, but all indications are that, you know, having that route would actually increase these numbers. So these numbers, this is what overall our students do. So it's not UK job specific. This is surveys that we do with our student body. And it can be that they're getting jobs in Dubai or the US or anywhere else as well. But we're looking at six months of graduating there. So when we talk about the graduate route, you're very, very right. It's two years. And after that, you need to find a sponsor. But the way I look at it, and I'll give you my own example, is when I was looking for a sponsor, you know, there were so many companies that wanted to, to, to get you on board because you come from a good university with a good competitive degree, but they didn't have the finances or the license to sponsor. So now what has happened is this will allow students to at least work, let's say, in a startup if they want to work for a mid-sized company, which honestly, un without the sponsorship model, wasn't an option for a lot of people. So it's opened out the market. And uh, what that also means is that you can switch between that. So within those two years, let's say you start off and get a job with a startup. And then in a year, you find that you can apply with, with a bigger company who maybe can sponsor you in two years, you know, then uh, you can do that as well. So it allows you that progression as well. And it's also an opportunity for you in those two years to prove that you're worth the sponsorship. So uh, I think it's, it's definitely got its merits and, and um, certainly opens out the market a lot more. To people so we'll see how the stats go in, in in maybe a few months once we get those opportunities but from what i've heard from the visa office is that a lot of international students are applying and one third of the applications are predominantly south asian and indian so um so we can see that they're making the most of the opportunity Yes, that's great. I do think that the interest in UK has really gone up in the last couple of years. And uh, I do hope that that's really going to be some successful applications for students. And uh, this yeah. perspective has actually given uh, both me and I'm sure a lot of students so much more excitement to apply for this flexible uh, degree because, you know, sometimes at 17, you're really not old enough to know exactly what you want. Yep. So yep. Uh, wonderful. And thank you so much for sharing this, Veer. Uh, what thank I you will do, uh, Richa, I think I just missed a direct message uh, from uh, someone. It's just about A-level. So um, I won't take your name. It, it was a direct uh, message to me. But, you know, the range is there. It's, it can be A, B for a newer subject, but most of the competitive subjects would be uh, uh, more than that. So the range is there. It's, I couldn't give you one answer for it, but, but just go ahead um, and look at the subject on the website. And I think you'll find for the A-level especially, there'll be a, a brilliant um, average given there that you can look at as a as an average for yourself what i will also do because i'm very conscious of people going into wrong sites i'm posting a link there this is to the graduate immigration route 
And so please use that link, uh, you know, to get the correct okay. information as well. So I'll end with that. And I've taken up time. I don't know who's next. Uh, Richa is... is <laughs> King's College. We've got Palak Behal from King's College next. Great, great, and great. she's already here. We had one Brilliant. last question since you were speaking about grades. Uh, I'm so sorry, Palak, to take into your time, but he's speaking about grades, which is... And, you know, uh, Sa when Sarah was speaking from an Imperial College, she sort of made it quite clear that Imperial is looking for students who are pretty much on top of their class. And, yeah. you know, sometimes students don't get their act together by the time, you know, they've entered grade 10 or, you know, grade 11. And, you know, by grade 12, perhaps they get their act together. So uh, would uh, St. Andrews also look for this very, very high consistent sort of profile? Or is there space for people who are sort of developing their academic profile? So I think there's it's it's unfortunately a, a mixture of the two. Um, we do look for progression, so we would ask for grades in the ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth, uh, and and the predicted. And we're not looking to see that you know you're at the top of and getting a hundred on hundred, but at least maintaining and and progressing in the right direction. Um, unfortunately, like I said before, you know the all four of us today, you know, we're victims of our own success, which means that you know. Um, we want to take in a lot more people, but we have to be competitive in our approach as well. So uh, we would predominantly look at the 10th and 12th grade to make academic decisions, but that progression is important to us as well. So um, we would value that consistency. And I think just one one last thing is, is uh, we are open to receiving additional tests as well. So for students who are maybe looking at the US and giving SATs and ACTs, it's not compulsory and you won't be at a drawback if you don't don't have it. But certainly, uh, I'm just talking from a St. Andrews perspective here, but we are open to receiving them uh, as well. So, so we will look at the entire picture. I think what's very important is suitability for the course. So your personal statement must be academic, it must be subject specific, and it must indicate, uh, you know, why, essentially, why do you want to study this subject? We're looking for the right fit for the subject as much as we're looking for a right fit to the university as well. So, um, so yes, progression is important and we do look at the high grades, but uh, there is opportunity for those who've improved over the years to, to stand a good chance as well. Got that, Veer. Thank you. That's a very clear picture to everybody. And thank you so much. Thanks for all your time, Veer. And uh, we've really got so much for you. Thank you for your time. Have a great weekend and hope to connect with you again. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Good luck, Palak. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Palak. Uh, Hi. And thank you for making the time. I know you've been, uh, you've had a really hectic week and you've just sort of landed back. And thank you for quickly coming here and making the time. We've heard from uh, Imperial College and we've heard from St. Andrews. And King's College, again, is this very London college. And uh, of course, London is where a lot of people want to be. And Kings is so well reputed in India. Uh, what uh, Palak will be focusing on, interestingly, is how to use the personal statement best to make your application as competitive as possible. If you remember, both Sarah and uh, Veer were saying that your grades a part of the picture, but I also look at the personal statement. So what really does the personal statement demand of you? We're really looking forward to this, Palak. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening, and thanks for joining in. I will share my screen. So how this will go is I'll just uh, run through a deck, and I won't dwell much upon each slide, just being mindful of the time, but I'll just take you through the broader points, and then we'll be happy to take any questions if you may have. So, uh, yeah. can you see my screen, Ucha? Yes, we can, Anpala. Right. So, uh, just briefly introducing myself. Uh, I'm the International Student or Recruitment Officer with King's College London, and I uh, uh, I look after India as well as Pakistan. So, we will be so. Uh, in the deck, I'll briefly uh, say some bits about London and Kings, uh, but majorly we will focus this on personal statements uh, only. To give you uh, uh, just some quick run facts about Kings, so uh, we 
were established in 1829, which makes us the fourth oldest university in England. So we have great history and legacy with that aspect. We are a leading member of the Russell Group. Uh, again, top 10 universities in the UK. We have alumni all over the globe and very proudly, we say this number that we've produced uh, 30 Nobel laureates so far. So, um, these are some stats which I see a lot of students obsessing over and specifically I would say Indian students. But we correctly pointed it out, you know, that, that uh, don't get obsessed with these, take them as a navigation rather than just, you know, uh, uh, just blindly following this obsession, I would say. So just to give you some sense there, we are, uh, as for the US latest world rankings, we are top three in London, top 10 in the UK and top 35 in the world. And also the bigger box that you see on the screen, of course, some of our subject rankings. So we are highly ranked for most of our subjects, because some of our subjects are number one in the world uh, and number one in the UK for some aspects. Yeah. To give you a sense of the King's community, we are a large university. We have uh, not one, but five campuses in the heart of London. We, I'll, I'll speak more about our location in our following slides. Um, we are about 34,000 students and interestingly about 50% of that number, which is about 16,000 are international students from uh, across 185 different countries. And from India, we have close to about 500 to 600 students on campus across undergraduate, postgraduate and research degrees. So that I feel is an interesting number because you feel at home, but at the same time, you're also part of a global culture, I would say. Right, so uh, this is one of my favorite slides to speak about is our location. So all the red boxes that you see on the screen are either campuses, hospitals, and libraries that are uh, owned by Kings. And all the subjects that you see mentioned uh, in those uh, across those red boxes are of course the subjects that are taught at that particular campus. Which we as so where you will be based on depends on what you choose to study. And uh, you can find that information on the course page as well. And for some courses, you might also be taught at two different campuses. And uh, this might look out pretty uh, spread out in the screen, but they're all within short bus rides and walking distance amongst each other. And all of them are very, very centrally located, I would say. And all the small purple boxes that you see on the screen are. Uh, you know, some famous tourist landmarks, important institutions, etc. For example, the Shard, the London Eye, Palace of Westminster, Tape Modern. So we're pretty much surrounded by the very best that London has to offer, I would say. And London has been rated the number one student city not once but multiple times in the row now. So, uh, I mean, and of course, that's for innumerable reasons I can state. So yeah, this is just about the location. If you need any, uh, you know, virtual tour, et cetera, of, of the particular campus you are uh, planning to study at, then of course all of that information is also available online. Now we have close to about 200 courses. So uh, of course it's not possible to put everything on the screen, but we broadly uh, divide them across faculties, which is STEM, uh, health subjects, uh, politics, economics, and society, management, and arts and humanities. Uh, there is also a bar on the screen, but if you just go on King's website, then you can find all the courses listed there. I've just put some few, I mean, some interesting post names under uh, each faculty category, but it's very, very important to, to go on the website, read the course page, because there is some interesting information that's that's uh, there and that's going to be very helpful for you to decide uh, if that course is for you and you know with you guys you have to given five choices in the competitive contrast etc that's really important so for example two uh, universities might offer a, a course called business management but what they actually teach under that course will most probably be similar but not exactly same so what interests you what aligns with what you want to do, uh, all of that will come out once you do the course research. So do that. Also, don't be very headstrong with just names, I would say. So, I mean, don't form an opinion before researching that I only want to do business management. Maybe when you read through the course content, you realize that international management is something that has more relevant modules that interest with what you want to do after, after a degree or uh, what you want to study uh, in your three years. So, be mindful of those things and uh, this will only be evident once you uh, 
read the website, read the course page, attend uh, taster days, virtual open days, etc. Taster lectures. So all of that information is important, I would say. So make that choice very, very rationally. We also have uh, another reason why, sorry, I'm just flipping back to the slide. Another reason why course page is very important because it clearly lists down the entry requirements. So, and I know there will be follow-up questions on that, but uh, of course there is a broad range of uh, entry requirements that we accept that I'll touch upon, but for that particular course, what exactly is needed to be mentioned on the website? So for example, one course might need an additional writing piece or something, or some courses might need preferred subjects or prerequisite subjects, etc. So for example, economic sources will need mathematics. Business management, we don't need maths till class 12, in class 12, I mean. So all of this will be mentioned on the course page on the website. So uh, very, very important to go through that before making an application, because if you don't meet, say, the required subjects, etc., then it's uh, your application will uh, not be considered, of course, because things is extremely competitive and we are very, very strict with grades. Uh, even if you, know, if you have like a 1% less, etc., it's... Uh, I have not seen that being considered with things. So things is extremely uh, strict with that. And also with uh, English language test scores, I would say. So, uh, I mean, we are on this, uh, uh, we are on entry requirements. I pretty much say that at this point as well. So uh, if you are an IB or an 11 student, we might exempt you from an English language test. But if you're a CBSE student, it is mandatory to give either the IELTS or the PTE. And it's very important to also meet the minimum uh, English language test score that's mentioned. So for example, if your band says you need a seven overall and 6.5 in each section, even if you have like say eight overall, 6.5 in three sections and six in one section, that's not gonna be accepted. You have to retake the IELTS. So be mindful of that. We also have uh, about 300 plus study abroad partners. So you can choose to do a semester abroad or a year abroad. And students who've done this have given us some exceptional feedback about this. So it's a great exposure. It's a great uh, learning. Uh, so uh, again, very, very preferred by students. Uh, very broadly about entry requirements, but again, uh, having said what I said before, uh, go through the course page as well to see what exactly that particular course needs. But usually for most of our uh, courses, for A-levels, we need uh, A star AA to ABB. IB, if you're an IB student, then we'll need 35 points overall. Um, and of course, there'll be combinations with HL665 to 766 and CBSC. Uh, usually it's 85 or 90 percent, but some courses it's also 80, so between 80 to 90. And like I said, subject requirements may apply. If you're a state board student, then you can't apply directly through a three year programs. You will have to apply through an international foundation year for an additional year that's there. So, right. So, before we go into personal statements, I'll tell you a bit about you guys because that's how uh, you apply for undergraduate degrees and. Uh, most of the universities that you're seeing here will uh, most accept it through UCAS as well. So uh, UCAS, you have five choices and only one person statement, which is why it becomes even more trickier to write that person statement because you might be, and these five choices could be in the same university as well. So a lot of students ask this to us that, you know, if I want to apply uh, to three different courses in the same university, can we do that? Yes, you can, but that's going to be counted as three different choices. Uh, there's, of course, a small fee, um, I think this, this the fee is slightly revised this year and the deadline uh, for our medicine programs, it's 15th of October for all of the programs is 26th of January this year. And what we look at is, of course, predicted personal statement, very, very important. Uh, academic records 10, predicted scores have already said, references usually we just need one at undergraduate level. And we don't have an interview except for our medicine courses, which is why personal statement becomes even more important because that's those 4,000 characters are pretty much uh, your best shot to convince the admissions team that why do you deserve that seat in the university, right? Because uh, prestigious, highly ranked universities uh, receive far, far, far more applications than the number of seats they have on offer, which means it, it's also very competitive to study at these universities. So I often tell students, if you're looking at rankings and if you're getting obsessed with this and you want to apply to a highly ranked university, then it's also important that you do your homework pretty much uh, to the highest uh, you know, the best possible way and submit an application that is strong enough to, to cut through the competition. Uh, for additional aptitude tests, we only need 
that for law and medicine. So we accept that for medicine and uh, LNAT for law. Yeah, so I think this we've covered. So coming back to persons fitness now, I'll start with very, very basics, of course, because being mindful of the time here. Broadly, what your personal statement should cover is capture attention quickly because admissions team needs tons and tons of personal statement in a day. I have seen a lot of students just, you know, up, even when they reach the second paragraph, they haven't even indicated their course preference there. So this is not the ideal way to do your personal statement. It should capture attention quickly. It should broadly demonstrate your motivation and enthusiasm to study that particular course and not university because... Uh, remember with UCAS, it's five choices and just one personal statement. So don't be university specific because if you're applying, if you really, I see a lot of students saying Kings is my dream college, should I mention it? I say, I always tell them no because you don't know what your decision would be and you don't want another university leading it, you know, for example, a, a King's name and, if, a, and if, what if your uh, offer gets rejected? So uh, be mindful of those things. Don't get over passionate, over enthusiastic, etc. Broadly, motivation, enthusiasm as to why you want to do that particular course. Demonstrate, of course, skills and competences. But what's more important here is all of this should be relevant to the course that you're applying for. So, for example, if you're a great chess player and if you're applying for an economics course, and if you can't relate the two, then don't don't uh, mention it because one four thousand characters is very very limited. Second, it has to tie back to the point. Uh, where it, it highlights your choice. So be specific to this, only only include relevant things. And like I said, be specific to the course and not the university. So broadly, your personal statement should be focusing on this aspect. Now, briefly, we will discuss about structuring your personal statement. Now, of course, this is not set in stone and this is a suggestion. So uh, start with intro and motivation. Why do you want to do the course that you're saying. So for example, if you want to study law, then why do you want to study law? What initiated that interested you? And all of this has to be credible, right? Don't mention things like, since I was in the womb of my mother, I want, always wanted to study law. Since I was in class, uh, uh, you know, like kindergarten, I was, always wanted to study law. This is not something that reflects as a, as a credible or well thought out person statement. Academic interests and achievements, uh, extracurricular should be followed after intro and motivation. So what have you done so far that's relevant to the course that you're applying for? For example, if you, if you want to apply for a business course, that have you done any internship? Have you read any books that are related to business? Have you done any online course that's related to business? Uh, so all of that will come into the middle section. And conclusion is equally important as introduction. So wrap up everything uh, sensibly, uh, rationally. And then this is how you broadly structure the person's statement, I would say. Quick points, lying and exaggeration absolutely uh, uh, does not reflect a good quality personal statement. If you're applying to a good university, all of these factors really play uh, like a catalyst uh, uh, in your decision making. And I've seen a lot of students who meet entry requirements or even exceed entry requirements, but don't get an offer because personal statement is a deal breaker. If you don't have a good personal statement, there are chances you will not get through. Also with things, if you meet the minimum entry requirements or even exceed it, I would say, it's no guarantee that you will get an offer, right? So you if that's just a prerequisite, I would say. Plagiarism is a big, big offense with you guys. I, every year I see students getting uh, warning emails from UCAS for plagiarized personal statements. So, I mean, it's okay to look at a template on the internet, you know, read through a few templates, et cetera, and see what you want to put across, but don't exactly copy a personal statement that your cousin wrote who got into a particular university or your friend's writing, et cetera. There is, personal statement is called personal for a reason because it's supposed to be unique and personal to you. And trust me, there is no best, there is no correct way to write a personal statement, I would say so. You have to be mindful of the work about the points and what it was simple, but there is no ideal way that if your friends written, that's the best way possible if you go through. Every year, the class uh, demographics is different. The cohort is different. So there are various factors that gets accounted into it. Uh, this we've already covered. Uh, be mindful of spelling and grammatical errors. You know, we are all um, in millennial and post-millennial words where we uh, subconsciously tend to use slangs or WhatsApp languages, Instagram languages. So avoid that. Also, because if you're applying to a UK university, don't use US spellings, use UK spellings because some spellings are different to the US and UK. 
excessive use of thesaurus is absolutely not needed unless of course you're applying for an english literature or that kind of a course but don't unnecessarily beautify language focus on the content rather than this so that's that's important a lot of indian students use unnecessary quotes that's not the most uh, ideal way i would say to write a course is like something like education is the most powerful weapon to change things etc change the world absolutely not needed so don't unnecessarily use quotes in your personal statement be mindful that the 4000 characters are really important don't waste them on these things i would say uh, also absolutely avoid bullet points or shopping list if you've done 10 courses uh, or 10 internships or read 10 books etc don't put it in a shopping list or a bullet list a bullet points kind of a format but what you have to do is have to be reflective and see what you've learned out of that that contributes to the course that you're applying and makes you a better applicant so if you've done uh, five internships in in different aspects of business and if you're applying for a business management or an international management course then you have to take the crux out of what you've learned out of those five internships and that has added to your knowledge or skill set and made you a better applicant for that business course so always type back and be reflective i would say in in a uk person statement so just to compare and contrast us gives you us person statement gives you prompts it's like a uk person statement there are no prompts it's a blank canvas of 4000 characters so it could be a good if i mean you could feel good about this because if you have a well thought out person statement you start on time you start early but this might also seem like a swimming pool you can't swim uh, if you start late so if you start about a week before the deadline then you will pretty much feel very drowned because that's you know those 4000 characters will really seem daunting to you because it it looks it's easier but it's actually not but don't overthink it also just just start on time and give uh, various drafts and read various drafts and come to a thought or post statement i would say i will just quickly do these uh, uh, i'm just being mindful of the time so of course you know different resources books etc documentaries uh, ted talks is a great way so you know you get some great content from ted talks and ted talks also has footnotes and reading lists that that supplements to content so use that uh, just some bits on introduction etc don't don't think about something that is to blow the universities away right you and another tip is to focus too much on the introduction first first write the main body because if you keep thinking on introduction the perfect introduction you'll never get through the main body and you'll waste a lot of time so first finish that main crux and context and then uh, in- include introduction and conclusion what are what i mean have you got, got an actual reason that you want to study that course it, it needs to sign person and like you right so um, of course there are various examples to it but i'm just uh, not tip going in that much detail basically is if there's any article that you read that inspired your interest or anything uh, any any book that you were reading that that's inspired you or, or you watch something that inspired you to study that particular course so just something that's authentic and credible i would say opening lines to avoid we've discussed a lot of these so you know for us as long as i can remember i've always wanted to study this from a young age i've always been interested in this so this is not the most authentic or credible way i would say to do a personal statement so uh, i mean on the slide you can see the difference between a good uh, starting and a bad starting i would say so uh, i just be mindful that in the starting it has to reflect your interest in motivation to study in an authentic way i would say and also uh, give an indication about the course you want to apply for so that's the main uh, i would say the the macro bits there so uh, proving yourself don't just tick boxes elaborate don't just mention i'm a great uh, learner i'm a i'm a great team player uh, you have to basically base it on evidence as to what you've done that supports it explain what you've gained from your experiences evidence we've mentioned eliminate the sentences that don't add value because 4000 characters is the absolute hard uh, limit to uh, your personal statement if you don't focus so much upon i would say uh, quantity or quality is really important an example to do the personal statement could be the car method which is context action and results so context is where you were what you were doing there what were the circumstances action is 
what was the activity why were you doing it what were the skills demonstrated result is what did you achieve what skills were improved what knowledge was gained so just to give some um, just to put this method into examples the context is i witnessed a nurse giving pills to a long term patient who suffered from dementia and the action was you know what being patient and taking the time to comfort the patient the nurse was able to convince how to take them she later told me this was a very common occurrence and this basically the result is through this i saw how large a role that patients and sympathy can play in having a good bedside manner so basically you have to put context action and result as to what's interested you to do that particular course work experience we don't mandatory needed for all courses basically it's a mandatory just for medicine courses but if you have work experience uh, then feel free to put it in a reflective in a in a uh, uh, you know relevant form i would say uh, right so we won't do much examples because there's a time constraint i would say so skip through these so it's just wrapping up the first statement so tie back to what you wrote earlier don't repeat intro word to word but you have to basically it has to be a well concluded and one one structural piece i would say uh and of course you can talk about your career aspirations as to why you want to do this course in terms of a career aspiration but for undergraduate course we don't necessarily expect student to have much clarity on that a lot of students tend to miss this point that you know uh, you also have to explain how do you add value to the university absolutely avoid using your character saying how great the university is honestly universities know how great they are they don't need to hear it from you uh, it's all on their website and what you have to use those 4000 characters because it's relevant to you use it in that content you have to explain why you should basically uh, why you are a right fit for that particular course the admissions tutor by reading the personal statement tries to match the right fit with the university culture the course with what you put in your personal statement so that should be the broader perspective read back what you've written you know draft redraft read discuss it with you know when you write the first draft discuss it with your counselor friend anybody you trust your sibling parents etc um uh, yeah most of things you've written which is just last page Uh, read it aloud even on your own because once you write it, once you hear what you've written, they might you know you might uh, when you read it out you might feel oh this is not something that's adding up or this is not something I I wanted it to be that particular way that you might just correct it. Uh, honest and genuine. Make sure that this is absolutely necessary within character count. Uh, basically, right. So three takeaways: evidence your experiences. Don't just mention. Make it authentic to you, and it's more about quality rather than quantity. I would say so. That's pretty much from me. And stop sharing. I'll also put my email ID. Uh, Yeah, I'll just put my email ID in the chat box. So if you have any questions, yeah, I'll just take a few. Richa, you're on mute. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, people sent you some uh, questions. Yeah, directly. I'll just yeah, I'll just take uh, them. So should we talk more about our achievements or? Or what we want to do after a degree. So there is, I would say, what you want to do after a degree. If you have clarity at an undergraduate level, sure, put it in in a line or two. But uh, even with achievements, uh, I would so okay. So UK person statements are about seventy. I would say at least eighty to eighty-five percent academic, unlike the US. So don't focus too much upon achievements. Also, so focus more on academics. And even if you have extracurricular or some achievements, you have to link it back to that. So this is a big difference between US and UK person statements. About eighty to eighty-five, I would say, easily a percentage of your person statement should be academic. Uh, so be mindful of that. Um, you want to moderate questions, Richa? Or should I? Sorry, there's a question here which I'm not textual offers. So, uh, I mean, contextual offers is basically based on predictors. I would say so, and more clarity for this will be on the website. I would say that. Right. Absolutely. Okay. 
uh, that's uh, good again. And uh, I think we got very good insights on the personal statement and, uh, you know, on what to do and what not to do particularly, because I do find that, you know, students sometimes do start with a very uh, global view and they try to make the starting really very dramatic. And uh, so I wanted to ask you that, do you think it's a good idea to start with something personal, you know, like, while the US gives a lot of value on saying something personal, like, you know, when I was uh, a child, I used to teach, um, you know, my cousins, and then I got interested in education, uh, eventually, you know, to get into your, uh, or, you know, I had the student who talked about how her grandfather used to do math puzzles with her in the when she was a child. And so she grew up with this interest in math. So is that sort of out of context for a personal statement? No, no. So it is authentic. It is relevant, of course. So uh, you have to make it sound more, I would say, authentic in person to you. So if you can support the what you mentioned with evidence, etc., then it's absolutely a good way to kind of mention that. Okay, all right. Wonderful. No, that's great. And I think that gives us a lot of insight. And there's been a lot of interest in this particular uh, session because the personal statement is sort of just all you have, those 4,000 characters to really showcase yourself. So thank you so much for giving all these examples and helping us uh, figure it out. I will be sharing the recording of this with some of the very interesting examples you've got up there as well. The do's and the don'ts. That's been very uh, interesting. I hope I haven't missed out. Yeah, someone's asked a question which I'm not very clear about when is the right time for grade 11 students to apply do you mean grade 12 students madhuri i would imagine she's saying grade 12 students that should one apply in october does it matter if you apply closer to jan 26 every application before uh, uh, the deadline will have equal consultation i think what she means is that if you're in 11 then you can just focus on i would say uh narrowing down the broader uh course uh, subjects etc so you know if economics interests you business interests you engineering interests you so just focus try to boil that down so that then you when you enter class 12 you can do relevant activities do relevant online internships or read books that that is relevant to that option and i think i read this question you don't need english language test course while making an application you can submit it without also but you will need it at some point before coming to the uk and just one point before i log off is uh ucas has a great uh personal statement builder tool you know so you can use that for for some clarity ucas is not just an application platform but it has some great tools to help you with personal statements and other things so do check that out as well this will, this will be helpful Right. No, that's, uh, uh, I think that pretty much answers all the questions over here. And I think some of the questions here you've already answered about the IELTS and the predicted scores, and we'll put that information here for the students. Thank you so much for your time, Palak, and thanks for making it. Uh, I know it's been a busy week for you, and you've made the time for us. Really appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank so you, Rajan. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much, and have a great week. Take care. All right. So uh, now we have one of the sessions that we've really been waiting for, which looks at uh, the very big picture of uh, applying to the U to the UK, as well as uh, represents one of the universities that everybody has on their list, uh, unless recommended otherwise, which is UCL, right? University College London, which leads the league tables in many um, subjects that uh, you may want to apply for in the UK. And we have Arvind, who's a senior liaison officer with uh, UCL, and he's worked with UCL for a long time. And he's really addressing a very, very interesting question of saying, how do you use all of the UCAS to really showcase your best self forward, the personal statements and the other uh, subject? What is the best way for you to make an application? And he'll also give us some insights about uh, UCL and what UCL is looking for. So Arvind, over to you. Do share uh, your experiences with everybody. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi, Richa, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's good to connect with all of you. Uh, so just bear with me a minute, and I will get the presentation. Do you want to give it a few minutes in case people need to pop out or pop in? Uh, I think people have been just, uh, joining back in. Okay. So uh, so I think we, we'll start. just crack on. Yes. Sounds good. I think Palak covered probably almost everything that I was going to say. So I need to now be more creative. <laughs> I have many more questions actually, which I had wanted to ask Palak. So maybe I can ask you even as you're setting up that you sure. can keep 
mind when you're sharing. You know, and like, I'm good to go now. Yeah, I can start. Uh, do you, let, let, let me go through this section and then yeah, fire right. in the questions. Okay. And then yep. you can the questions. Yeah, let's do that. I got some time, so don't worry. I've, I've cleared out all my other things. So, Thank you so much. Thanks. No worries. Uh, is this visible now? Can you see the screen? Yes, it's visible. We can okay, see. good. Excellent. All right. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. What I plan to do today is uh, essentially highlight, bring together some of the key elements of apply making an application through UCAS and also making sure that um, when you're applying to universities, how do you make your application stand out? How do you draw upon the various elements of your application and how do you go about doing that? And I know Palak gave a, a very good uh, a presentation on what the personal statement is. And I'll touch briefly on that and uh, you know we'll make our way through it and I'm happy to answer some questions. The first and foremost thing is when you're looking to apply to universities, you always start with your aspiration. That's the first thing you have. The next phase is your exploration, then your comprehension, which is what I call understanding what is required of you. And then finally the execution when you decide to apply. So there are four broad phases, no matter what you do, which university you apply to, which country you apply to, that is the kind of mental journey a potential student or an applicant will go through. And the first and foremost thing when you're looking at any country, any university system, is to identify and make the right choices. And there are many parameters. Um, you need to first and foremost look at the institutions that you're considering. You probably have a short list. And some of the key elements that students have told us that they look at would be location, of course, we are in London, which is fantastic for us, but uh, that may not be for everybody. You know, somebody might want to be out in the countryside, somewhere in Midlands, somewhere quieter. Um, it's up to them. Uh, at the end of the day, it's up to you. You need to identify these parameters and do your research and identify the institutions. Then you look at the programs. There are a variety of degree programs that are available from a simple, straightforward three of uh, program to join programs, combine programs. Uh, there are programs with a year in industry, also known as a sandwich course in the UK. Um, so there are lots of options there for you to explore. So be very clear which of these programs best suits your interests. So look at what the content is. Look at the modules being taught. And also remember, if the course title looks similar, it's very likely that the modules and the way the course and the degree is being taught will vary. So you need to go institution by institution, look deeply into the modules and see where the difference lies. Look at the way the program is taught. Is it more of lectures? Is it more of seminars? Is it how much of self-study is there? What is the con amount of research exposure you're going to get? Uh, what kind of... Um, uh, opportunity do you have after your degree? What are the resources, facilities? So these are all the things that you start, you know, you really need to start doing your research. Um, ideally, after you finish your year 10, you're in year 11 and you're looking ahead and you're planning. Uh, for those of you in year 12, I'm sure you probably have done all this and you already lined up your uh, options and you're ready to hit the send button. The next important criteria is entry requirements. And my one advice to you is please, please, please take all the time you need to do, but make sure that you study the entry requirements very carefully and understand it. If you have any doubt whatsoever, uh, don't hesitate to contact the university and get the clarification. Remember, you have only five choices and you need to make each of the five choices count. You need to make sure that you offer the exact subjects or the level of study that is required for the program. Now, there'll also be additional requirements, uh, including tests like the BMAT or UCAT for medicine or the LNAT for law. Uh, some institutions may ask for a TSA or the STEP paper for math, um, fine art program, architecture programs, they will require portfolios. So these are things you need to make sure you identify, list out very clearly. And if there are any external tests 
to which you need to apply, make sure you apply by the deadline so that you don't lose out. Uh, sometimes there could be capacity issues with venues. So make sure you get in there, get your applications in and get the results for those tests. And then the costs. I mean, this is the single, single biggest uh, bugbear for anyone, which is uh, undoubtedly so. It is a huge investment, both in times of uh, finance, financial resources, but also in terms of um, your time and the commitment that you need to put in. So look at the costs, look at, look at the makeup of the institution, look at the diversity in the classroom, look at the diversity on campus, look at the diversity on the staff. And then what are the resources? What does this university offer you? Uh, labs, libraries, studios, lecture theaters, what else? So it's the plus factor, the X factor that you're looking for. And of course, you do have ideas about employability. So look at the kind of support they give to their students in terms of careers. Um, what are the opportunities that exist? Are there opportunities to work during term? Are there opportunities to do projects? Are there opportunities to do uh, internships during your holidays? And eventually going on to, uh, you know, perhaps seeking employment and getting employment. Now the employment might not be the route for many. Some of you might be thinking of going on for further studies uh, for a master's or a PhD. Are there opportunities for that? Uh, so it's all these factors that you first need to be absolutely clear when you make your choices and your shortlisting institutions. And you may add many more. Uh, these are just some of the very popular common ones that uh, potential applicants look, look at. But it's up to you. You might have extra modules, um, extra criterion that you want to add. Uh, maybe student accommodation. You know, facilities and student accommodation is important. Um, student support. So all these things come into play, and you need to spend some time doing that. Uh, you know the drill. Uh, you apply through UCAS. So I'm not going to dwell much longer. I'm sure you're already prepped up for this. But the key thing is keep an eye on the deadlines. And I'm sorry, if there's a wrong date on the slide. I just noticed it wasn't updated. Uh, just to clarify the application deadline for 2022, September entry is the 26th of January, uh, not the 15th. Uh, so I do apologize. Uh, that's my bad there. Now, what I want to do is look at what we do at UCL and just roll it out in the wider context because something similar would be applying or taking place in most of the top very competitive and selective institutions. This year, we received over 67,000 applications for 2021 entry. And we do offer a wide range of programs covering the academic spectrum. And I'll speak briefly about these a little later. And the competition for places tend to vary by degree program. I've just put up the number of applications we received per place on some of the programs. Fine art seems to attract the largest. It's quite likely that they have a small intake as well, but it's very competitive. But across the board, many of our programs attract a high volume of applications. And on an average, we're looking at about 10 applications per place. So this puts a lot of pressure on the institution and all it also adds that comes back to you uh, in the loop, in the application loop, is that you need to make sure that your application really truly stands out. Now, what are some of the key elements when you submit? What are the things that the universities use to make decisions? Your UCAS form, first and foremost, it all starts from there. The entire form is viewed. So it starts with your personal statement. They look into your academic background, your academic history, uh, then comes your recommendation and the predicted scores from your school. So that is taken in it's a holistic assessment of these uh, elements of the UCAS form. Some, in, some universities will also have interviews for certain programs, not all programs. So make sure that if a program requires an interview, you find out the structure of the interview, the format of the interview, and the timing of the interview. And that is very important. And you also need to prepare for it. Uh, typically for interviews, the main assessment for them is to get a feel. It's not to test a subject knowledge specifically, but it's to see whether 
you are comfortable, they're testing your communication skills, they're testing your general awareness. Um, that you know, these are the kind of things they're looking for in an interview. They won't exactly ask you to start solving formulas or you know, um, put up models and so forth. So make sure that you know if your program requires an interview, find out every bit that you need to know and prepare for it. Now, there will be certain external admissions tests which are outside of the uh, UCAS scope, but it is a program requirement. And I've just mentioned two, but there are a few more as well, like a TSA or the uh, STEP for certain programs that ask for mathematics and it could be a part of the condition. So again, that's very important. These scores get fed back from the uh, examining body or the examination center. They get sent to the universities and they then are looked into uh, very often, say for example, at UCL, once the BMAT scores come in, um, that's when they start shortlisting. They can look at candidates and uh, whom to shortlist for interviews and so forth. LNAT is again, absolutely integral for law. And for us, LNAT could also be the deal breaker. Um, I think this year we received something in excess of 4,000 applications for our law program. Uh, so LNAT is something you need to pay close attention to if you have law on your uh, radar. And there are other requirements as well that I touched upon briefly. Portfolios are important. There will be programs, departments, universities. Now, a lot of them will ask for a supplementary essay or they'll email you a questionnaire. So it's nothing to panic about when you get these requests from the institutions. It's a part of the institutional selection process. So just go with it, complete what needs to be done. And um, some universities might also require you to complete a task at home and then upload um, the results. Or say, for example, if we ask for certain freehand drawings to be submitted, they give you a, a week to complete it uh, for the School of Architecture, and then you upload it. So there could be certain tasks, there could be certain things that you'll be asked to submit outside of it. So they look at each and every part of this uh, process and each and every part builds up to the holistic assessment at the end of the day. So it's very important you pay attention to that. Now we confer very closely with our academic selectors, the admission selectors, and we do ask them, what is it you're looking for in a student? And time and again, time and again, as uh, Richard did mention that I've been at UCL for a while, I think these points that I put up on the slide have come back repeatedly. They put yourself in the minds of the uh, academic tutors, put yourselves in the minds of the professors and the teachers and the readers who are gonna be teaching you. So what, who do they wish to teach? What kind of student do they wish to teach? So just flip the mirror over once, put yourself in their shoes, and then you'll begin to appreciate the points that they've come back, they've told us what is very important. First and foremost, of course, is your academic ability. But more than that, uh, in addition to the ability, you need to also have that interest in the subject. And then of course comes the motivation and the enthusiasm to study. Um, so this is a commitment you're gonna make and you need to uh, have that drive and the desire and the motivation. You need to have an understanding of what it is you're coming to study. Um, broad brush strokes, they're not looking for very in-depth knowledge, but you need to know if you're coming in to do economics or if you're coming in to do chemical engineering or you're coming in to do uh, philosophy or anthropology, you need to have an understanding of what this degree uh, involves. If you're coming in to study medicine, you need to understand what it involves in terms of time and effort and the commitment and it's gonna drain you. Uh, so these are all the things that you need to have as part of you know, your mental makeup. And then what are your transferable skills? Uh, that is extremely important because they're at every stage, they make assessments. They're looking at, do you have the critical thinking skill abilities, your communication skills, time management, independent learning, uh, because that is one part of the UK system. When you come in to study, they will require you to do a lot of independent study. For every hour in the classroom, you may have to put in three to five hours of independent study or more. So these are some of the transferable skills that they'll be looking for. And last but not the least, 
it's your potential to contribute um, both in and outside of the class. Remember, you are a collaborator with the institution. You are a partner with the institution. Yes, you may be a student, but you're a part of the community. Uh, so it's very, very important for them to get the feel that, you know, they can believe in your potential and they probably recognize your potential to contribute both in and outside of the classroom. Now, how do we select the applicants? Um, we receive a very high volume of applications. We get far more applications than the places that are available. So this is kind of counterintuitive, this slide. We look at the qualifications. Um, it could be the A-levels, the IB diploma, it could be the ISC, the CBSC, or all the other qualifications that we accept from around the world. Look at your personal statement, the reference, and then of course the additional elements. So these all play a very integral part. Program requirements are very important. I touched upon that. When you're doing your research, look at the offers that are made. What are the minimum requirements that they'd be asking for? Look at subject specific requirements, very, very important. And ensure that when you're completing your UCAS form, you fill out each and every single section. Don't leave out sections there. And the use of the personal statement, and I'm sure Palak touched upon this uh, a few minutes ago, you have to remember that a good personal statement is no compensation for grades below the requirement. It just doesn't cut ties with us. For us, a good personal statement very often could be the key deciding factor. It could be the element on which we either make an offer or we don't make an offer. Uh, we could even use this to take students to the next stage in the selection process. Uh, we use it at interviews. Um, so it's very, very important that you write this. And so when you, have, when you have this level of competition, when you're competing against a global network of students, how do you make your application stand out? By the time your application gets to the institution and goes through the selection process, keep in mind that applications will be received by students who are expected to meet the entry requirements, who have already met the entry requirements or, or have exceeded the entry requirements. So you're in that pool. And how do you make your application stand out? And it's the personal statement very often. It comes down to that on the basis of which they get your profile and then they decide whether to make an offer or not. So the first thing you need to do is, like I said before, have an understanding of what the degree involves. Research it, research what you learn on it. And what are some of the skills that you need to succeed on a degree? Um, is it mathematical skills? Is it uh, writing skills? You know, these are the kind of things that you need to understand when you're reading about applying to institutions and programs. Get a piece of A4 paper and start writing. Why do you wish to take this degree? What is your motivation? And then start making a list of very specific examples of what you have done, the activities you have undertaken that actually prove that you're suited to this degree. So remember, as uh, was it was mentioned before, it's about reflecting back what you've gained by undertaking these activities. A personal statement is not just a litany of you telling us what you have done, but it is of you telling us what skills you've gained by undertaking these activities and how these then relate back to the program. How do they help you with your learning process? And that is extremely important. And uh, I know she, uh, Palak went with the slide uh, CAR, I think, or a CAB. Um, and it's something similar. What activities did you do? What did you learn? How is it relevant to your course? How will they help you in your studies? At every stage, you need to make sure that this is extremely robust and solid so that you stand a very good chance. In effect, your personal statement should have the effect of reaching out to the tutors and saying, here I am. Um, these are the, my grades that I'm predicted to get. Look at my skill set and look what I can bring to your university. So make me an offer. Essentially, that is what you need to do. And I'm not going to go through this because I'm sure you're all more than familiar with it. Uh, just remember the top two bullet points that are there. It's your opportunity to explain why you are suited to the degree 
And it's also a chance for you to demonstrate your potential. And that is extremely critical for you to keep in mind. It is this chance that you have, you know, we know, okay, you're going to, you know, you're predicted a certain score. You're probably getting going to get your BMAT or LNAT or any other external scores, your portfolio assessment. It comes down to this. And this plays a very, very important part. The personal statement I cannot reemphasize. You probably hear it from every UK university representative saying that, but it's extremely critical. And this can make or break your uh, chances. So to sum up, do your research, check for the subject specific requirements. Please, please, please proofread. That's very, very important. Grammar, spelling. <clears throat> Seek clarification from the universities in advance. Uh, don't second guess. If you're not sure of the interpretation or you can't, you have certain doubts, write to them or call the universities and ask for clarifications. Make sure that you complete the application and more importantly, stick to the deadlines. There may be some flexibilities at other institutions where they could uh, accept late applications. But for us, 26th of January, is the deadline for all programs. And I suspect that will be the case at most of the other selective institutions. Um, late applications may not get the equal consideration or they may not be considered at all. So you have to keep that in mind. So keep that. Many of your schools will have their own deadlines. The school counselors will come in, they'll set a deadline, internal deadline for you to get your application in. So tick all the boxes, get it done, get it out. I'm just posting up a couple of useful links. I believe it should be helpful for you. Um, the UCAS website is a fantastic resource. So use it diligently, you got to, Great center, the hub for students, the UCAS hub. You can register your details and there's so much information, absolute wealth of information. It also allows you to connect through Unibuddy with students uh, studying across institutions to get first-hand experience. Explore the subject areas. That's a very, very good development on the UCAS site and spend a lot of time on that. It's extremely important. Um, I'm going to take a couple of minutes and quickly go through UCL, just tell you a little bit about it. I'm sure most of you are familiar, and then we'll spend some time on the Q&A. So you know we are based in London. You want to know this. And uh, what we tend to do in the institution is not just restricted within our walls, within our compounds or the studios or lecture theaters. We tend to have a global impact. Uh, every single thing we do impacts across the world. We have active research currently uh, you know, in Latin America using drone technology to identify water, underground water resources. We are involved in space in our search for ex exoplanets. Uh, we discovered uh, properties similar to planets having um, hydrogen, properties similar to hydrogen in other areas. Um, all elements of life sciences, and I think what is probably very interesting for us was a few years ago, we had a group of our students in second year who won a $1 million social enterprise prize uh, to help prevent rice wastage in uh, East Asia. So it's just enormous. I think what happens at the institution just goes above and beyond and just permeates across the world, making very important contributions. We were established in 1826 and uh, we were the first non-sectarian institution in England. In those days, if someone had to go uh, to university to study, they had to be male practicing members of the Church of England. So UCL was the first institution that admitted students irrespective of their backgrounds. We were the earliest to admit women on equal terms to men into education. And we also started teaching a lot of modern subjects. And it's that nature, I think that's what sets us apart the fact that we challenge convention and we continue to do it. We are coming close to 200 years now and we continue to do that. Our academics, our students, we challenge the convention. So, you know, the word now is disruptive thinking, but we've been doing it for a very, very long time. Uh, we are located in central London in an area known as the uh, Knowledge Quarter, surrounded by uh, museums, galleries, libraries, other academic institutions as well, hospitals, research institutes, think tanks, 
and about 70% of our student accommodation is around this area in central London. Uh, next year, we'll be opening our new campus, UCL East, where we're going to be delivering a whole new set of programs. Majority of those programs are going to be masters, and there will be a few undergraduate programs delivered there as well. And we take on some of the biggest challenges. Everything we do as an institution feeds into addressing these big challenges, uh, be it looking at global health, justice and equality, using technologies, cultural understanding, um, trying to maximize the availability of resources, you know, developing sustainable cities and human well-being. And what we can do with this, given the sheer size of UCL as an institution, the fact that we've got 11 faculties with about 65 academic departments, and each and every one of those faculties is well leading in research. Uh, so we are able to bring together that expertise in a very, very interesting interdisciplinary manner to address all these issues. And the best example was last year during the COVID lockdown, we actually had uh, mechanical engineering faculty working with our clinicians from the University College Hospital who partnered with an industrial partner, uh, Mercedes uh, Powertrains Unit. And they repurposed, they spent 10 days. Uh, none of them went home for 10 days. They were virtually in a lockdown and they repurposed and re-engineered a breathing apparatus to help with the breathing, which is known as a CPAP. Uh, those designs have, are available free and they've been downloaded around the world in many countries to help fight COVID. Uh, it's just one of those exciting things where people from different areas can come together and work and make a difference. And everything we do feeds into these pathways and streams and we're extremely proud of that. You could study almost everything. Uh, we have close to 400 undergraduate programs spread across 11 faculties, ranging from traditional three-year programs to inter integrated four-year programs with the medical degree at uh, six years. And you've got programs with a year in industry, there are programs with a year abroad, a semester abroad. So plenty of opportunities right there. Uh, if you haven't thought of it, get onto the website, have a look through, do some research. And we are amongst the top research-led institutions in the world. And there are some fantastic opportunities for our students to actually get involved in research from a very early stage. And one of the things we do is we draw upon our research strength to introduce our students to research groups right from the first year. And we shape the way on how to think. It's not about what to think, but how to think and approach a problem and resolve it. And that is something we do very, very well at the university. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of some of the alumni you might know, uh, Coldplay, all four were at UCL at the same time. But of course, if we go back in time, uh, we had Rabindranath Tagore, uh, one of our 30 Nobel laureates, but he didn't finish his degree. Uh, so it's still showing up as incomplete in our system. Of course, Francis Crick and Alexander Graham Bell, uh, the man who, you know, without whose invention, I don't know how we're going to survive uh, these days. And there are plenty of other things as well. So we are not just an institution where we lock people up till they write research papers and win awards. Uh, there's plenty of extracurricular activities, clubs, societies, sports. Whatever your interest, there's plenty of uh, mechanisms there to support. Um, if there is something you're interested in, we don't offer it, come and speak to us. We can help you set it or we can find uh, resources for you to practice your sport or set up a society or undertake a cultural activity. There's plenty of support for careers as well. And uh, we draw up on our location. Being in central London, we draw up on our profile and our presence with our connections across the sectors. And it's a great place to be in. Um, you know, a lot of exciting new things happening, um, emerging entrepreneurship, startups, tech companies, finance companies, business, you name it, it happens out here in London. And politics, of course, with Westminster at our doorstep. Uh, just briefly, I gave you an overview of what universities look for, how to make yourself stand out. And when the application comes in, what are some of the things that we look at as UCL? Um, you know, we just look through it and we'd like to see 
the kind of individual you are, the kind of mindset you have. Are you a brave thinker? Remember, we are an institution that thinks outside the box. Um, what is it you're bringing to the institution? Do you have a global view? Um, are you intellectually adventurous? Do you have good intercultural skills? Are you open-minded, open to new experiences, open to learning, uh, open to undertaking activities? And more importantly, independence and resilience, uh, that is absolutely critical. You know, that for us is very, very important. So we take on what comes in, in terms of all your predicted scores, your test results, and your personal statement. And we try and assess how best you meet our requirements. Our academic requirements are not impossible. Yes, they're high. Um, in some cases, we've had complaints where we said we're too high, but that's what we demand. You will get detailed uh, breakdowns, uh, individual country breakdown on each program page in the prospectus. And we look at various elements. So we look at your achievements, we look at your uh, tests, if they're required, uh, some programs conduct interviews, the English language proficiency, and of course your UCAS application, which involves the personal statement. So what you need to remember, and uh, just before I wrap up, is what uh, my colleague Palak mentioned, uh, and just to reiterate what she said, you know, we are looking for excellent writing, uh, which is unique to you, but we're also looking for you to reflect back and what you learned from it. That is extremely important for us. You know, the person who's reading your statement would like to choose the most interesting and the most motivated students to teach. Never forget that point. And that is very, very critical as you apply. Now I'm going to wind up now. Um, we have an in-country officer, Namita Pandey. Um, you, you're welcome to email her if you need further information on UCL and applying to UCL. Um, have a, get in touch with her. If you have any further questions, you want to contact me, uh, you've got my email out there as well. So I'm going to stop my share now, and uh, then we will uh, take some questions. Yes, and there are a lot of them already uh, here uh, that I have for you, Arvind. But, you know, thank you so much. It was such an uh, amazing insight into the impact that UCL is really making and into the global uh, character of the university, really. I think uh, it is, of course, one of the most competitive places to get in. So we got that too, you know, similar to what Sarah said from Imperial College, that there are no shortcuts around grades that you know uh, uh top grades are what we are looking for and beyond yeah. that what your personal statement can add it's a, a sort of a tough but very clear message coming from uk universities because often you know from other universities around the world you do hear them saying that you know uh, it's all right if your grades are not that great but if you have a great profile but always what happens is that prof you know when you have competitive grades and when you don't you just lose out so that clarity of messaging from all of you i think is very good for our students to hear as well so um, uh, everything else, I think those those pictures really blew my mind. I think uh, the diversity of the ideas that students have and what UCL represents is I really got a true insight into it. Let me quickly run you through some of the questions. Yep, sure. One has been there right from the beginning, which is saying, why is it called University College London? Is it like a college? Is it a university? What is the difference between that and a university? <laughs> uh, how much time do we have? Uh, we we are we are a, an independent institution, but we are also a part of the University of London Federation. Uh, the closest example I could probably draw is something like, uh, say, the University of Delhi with all the colleges under it, oh, okay, which right. are affiliated to it. So, for example, um, when we were set up in 1826, we were actually founded as the University of London, and then. Um, you know, as time went on and then Kings was set up after us and uh, then you needed to have a central examining body. So then the central university came and we retained our, so we became a college of the University of London. And uh, so, yes, we are a full fledged independent institution, a university in our own right with 11 faculties and we have our own degree awarding powers. Uh, yeah. So we award a UCL degree. That, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you so but much. But I can send a, yeah, there's a massive book on our history, but, uh, you know, unless someone is really 
gagging to do it it's another time <laughs> yeah. no great so now one question which i think you know is very admission focused is hmm. uh, you know that what are the entry requirements for ucl like what kind of grades do i need at a minimum like less than 90% i don't have a chance does 9th 9th 10th 11th or 12th matter you know uh, yep. how tough is this grade requirement i think people ask this uh, direct question sure. yeah the grade requirement is tough uh, there's no flexibility there uh, so if we say we want uh, 395 and 290 you need to have those 395 and 290 to even be considered um so it tends to vary um i think you we've got programs where there are 495s and a 90 for the isc cbsc probably dropping down to three uh, sorry 490s and an 85 maybe but 85 is very very rare if you're looking at the top end the very competitive programs you know to stand a chance you better be scoring 90 95 and above and this is across all five papers so we don't do the best of three best of four we don't indulge in that so it's straight across the board you need to make sure you hit those scores and for certain programs it's very clear uh, for example economics we need applicants to have a minimum 95 in mathematics so there's no negotiation on that um, you know for example we've had students who got a 94 or a 93 and they write in it doesn't cut ice and um, i usually tell i get calls from students uh, who have narrowly missed out their offers and i tell them go on to your insurance because you'll only end up waiting because i know what's going to happen at the end of the thing uh, so they're very very strict about it we don't look back into the ninth and so forth um, typically when students are completing the grades you know um, they would enter their year 10 the board board results from the 10th and then the 11th which is we know as an internal assessment and then the 12th um, of course this year it's all changed they're going to have their 12th exams in two parts um, so you know we we are we are quite aware of the developments our admissions team is on the ball and we keep an eye on that and the other thing i also want to add is uh, we will require an ielts or a toefl and that is compulsory so even if you've studied in english medium unless you've got certain classifications in i uh, if you're doing the ib english hl or sl or if you're doing the a levels in english then the de- admitting department could exempt you but uh, we will require that so you'll have to make allowances for that got that arvin so i uh, just a couple more questions i have hmm. one is still to do with admissions which is you know about grade 11 scores you know because uh, you uh, have this phenomenon called the great indian dip where you know the great ele- grade 11 scores dip so how does ucl see that is it important for them to consistently have those sort of grades across 10th 11th and 12th well, that's a good question um we do know of the dip Uh, we are aware of the dip and the tutors take that on board i think what they'd like to see is consistency and uh, not an earth shattering dip where it just the bottom falls off and someone has a spectacular drop in which case some alarm bells are likely to ring and they may contact the uh, reference the referee the academic referee for some clarifications but they will keep that on board the first thing they would be looking at is your predicted scores in year 12 that's the starting point that's where they start looking at and they look at that and then they kind of work their way back and they write how's the academic performance been at what level has the student been performing and um less you know there's been a very major drop in grades um it's not to be too worried too concerned i would say got that yeah wonderful so uh, another question which a number of people have asked is about this masters in engineering uh, which is you know in uk it sort of it's still an undergraduate degree even though it's a masters the four year degree if you can just clarify that uh, for the sake of uh, some of the people who've been asking yeah sure um so you do have a typical degree in uk a bachelor's degree is for three years and there are some subjects which have an integrated fourth year which results in a master level qualification and some of them do it because of the um, association and affiliations with professional bodies say for example students who study pharmacy the first degree they do is known as an m farm in india but if you come to india and say an m farm the indian m farm is actually a master 
master's degree that you finish or you did in the old system previously you had the b farm and the m farm and now it's changed to a full farm b so you get the master degree with that you could also straight apply for a phd if you wish but it can also open up a lot of uh, opportunities with uh, professional certifying bodies like chartered association of engineers it can get you membership into that um, so some students tend to take that straight out so that they finish it and then they get into the you know job market so it's up to you whether you want to do a bsc or an ma mang but remember usually the fire the fourth and the final year could involve uh, it will involve some teaching so there will be advanced modules but there'll be a huge research project tagged onto it uh, if you look at many of our four-year programs the fourth year is uh, immense amount of research that's conducted in the labs um, but you'll have no issue i mean it's up to the students if they're comfortable with the three year or a four year but at the end of some of the four years you do have the uh, you know opportunity to get the membership of certain uh, professional bodies and organizations a sort of an accreditation which really uh, has it's a sort of, of yeah so for example if you want to practice as an engineer then you have the association of engineers and uh, so on and so forth so yeah Right. Wonderful. So this sounds uh, uh, very nice and I think it's very useful for uh, students who are looking at then applying to you, the US or Canada where you need that 16 years of education. So the four year degree really uh, gives that to them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we've had, I know of our students with a three year degree who've gone to the US to do a, a master's. And I know students who've done the four year as well who you know, just segue naturally into a master's in the uh, US. So I usually tell if you're planning to study in US, always first check with the university to which you wish to apply. What is their stance? Uh, but to date, we've had no problems from our students. Uh, nothing's been reported back as yet. Excellent. Very nice. So uh, that's very uh, good to hear, uh, Arvind. And I think that the insights into the university and into the competitive process are also great to hear. Uh, a lot of students this year are looking at the top universities of UK. I think over the last two years, the interest in UK has been consistently growing. And somehow mm -hmm. during COVID, I found that the, that interest really grew. Uh, and uh, I hope again this year, uh, some, some of our students are going to be really successful and many more students are able to see these opportunities and apply. So thank you so much for your time, Arvind. Thank you for oh, uh, making this whole event happen. It sort of uh, came together because you agreed to be part of our panel. And no, thank no, you so you're, much. you're too kind, I think. Oh, I know <laughs> Let's put it that way. I saw the others who were participating and I said, yeah, how could I not do it? <laughs> That's sweet of you to say, Arvind. Thank you so much. Thanks oh, for being pleasure. here. Thanks for all your insights and have yeah. a great weekend. Thank you, people, for being with us. And uh, quickly, I also want to just share with you uh, our uh, contact details in case anybody wants to reach out to us. Um, uh, Simran has already shared that and she'll be sharing a recording of both the events as well and uh, you can uh, reach out to us for any guidance that you're looking for uh, there, there's Poonam's number here that's our website and that's our email ID and you can reach out to us at any time thank you so much for being there through the whole long day thank you very much and thank you Arvind thanks Richard take care all the best everybody take care everybody have a great weekend